Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. So, Sarah, you have about 20 minutes. Um, we hope you're, and we know you want to talk about the minimum wage, but we hope you'll talk about the minimum wage itself as well. But the floor is all yours. We're expecting a couple of more members to, to drift in. But we have to get started right now. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for having me. My name is Saru, and I'm sorry I'm a little bit sick, so hopefully you can hear me okay. We have it at our top volume, and you're good. Okay, great. So uh, I, I am a professor at the University of California at Berkeley in the Goldman School of Public Policy. I am also the president and co-founder of the Restaurant Opportunity Center United, a national organization of 130,000 restaurant workers, 770 restaurant companies ranging from very large chains to small mom and pop restaurants all over the country, and about 30,000 consumer members. So we are workers, employers, and consumers working together for better wages and working conditions in the industry. I founded the organization just after 9-11 together with workers uh, in New York, and 17 years later, we've grown. We've published about 65 reports and three books on the industry. I see on the table. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, fork is right here. <laughs> and we've done a lot of different things, including open and run our own restaurants and train thousands of workers in those restaurants to move up the ladder into livable wage jobs. But we've also done a ton of research. And our research shows that right now we are, as the restaurant industry, both the nation's uh, largest and fastest growing industry with almost 14 million workers, and by far one of the largest and fastest growing industries in Vermont. Uh, we are uh, one in 11 American workers work currently in one industry, the restaurant industry, and one in two Americans and one in two people in Vermont has worked in the restaurant industry at some point in their lifetime. And yet, despite the industry's size and its growth, it continues to be the absolute bottom of the barrel, lowest paying employer in the United States and in Vermont. Every year, the Department of Labor, at least until uh, <coughs> there was a functioning Department of Labor, put out a list of the 10 lowest paying jobs. Every year, we have been the seven lowest of the 10 lowest paying jobs. And of those seven lowest paying jobs, I think this is the part many people don't understand. Four of the seven lowest paying occupations in the United States are tipped occupations, including servers and busers. And that is because, for the most part, tipped workers work in very casual restaurants and diners, making very little money in tips. So the reason that you've got one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America with the lowest paying wages of, of any industry really is the money power and influence of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association, we call it the other NRA. Uh, it, it represents the chains, the IHOPs, the Applebee's, the Olive Garden. And in doing research for that book of mine that's sitting in front of you, <laughs> um, we uncovered that, uh, in fact, um, the, this uh, minimum wage is a legacy of slavery, that, in fact, this uh, trade lobby, the other NRA, has been around in various forms for 150 years that in fact tipping originated in feudal Europe. It was a practice um, in which aristocrats and nobles gave something extra or a bonus to serve for vassals, but always on top of a wage. When the idea came to the States in the 1850s and 1860s, it was rich Americans traveling to Europe, coming back, trying to show off that they knew the rules of Europe. And it was right around the time of emancipation uh, and the restaurant lobby demanded the right to hire new lease employees at emancipation, pay them nothing, since they had not been paid anything for generations, and have them live entirely on tips, which was a mutation of the original concept of tipping. Tipping was always something on top of the wage. When it came to the states because of slavery, it became wage replacement. That idea of tips as wage replacement became law in 1938 as part of the New Deal, when everybody got the right to a minimum wage, except, of course, a couple of categories of workers of color, farm workers, domestic workers, and, of course, tipped workers, who were left behind at zero dollars an hour as long as tips brought them to the full minimum wage. We went from zero dollars in 1938 to 80 years later, two dollars and 13 cents at the federal level, and, of course, something over four in Vermont. Um, a $4 increase in Vermont over 80 years, a $2 increase federally over 80 years. Um, today, 43 states follow this legacy of slavery with a sub-minimum wage for tipped workers, and 70% of tipped workers nationally are women. It's actually higher in Vermont. It is actually almost 80% 
of shift workers and servers in Vermont that are women. These are women who suffer from three times the poverty rate of the rest of the U.S. workforce in Vermont. Shift workers and servers suffer from 3.3 times the poverty rate of the rest of the Vermont workforce, means the poverty rate among shift workers and servers is actually higher in Vermont than it is in the rest of the country. Shift workers also use uh, food stamps at double the rate of the rest of the U.S. workforce. Um, and so regardless of how you want to argue how tips are calculated and whether they're reported, the fact that this population uses food stamps at double the rate of the rest of these workforce, given how difficult it is to get food stamps and how stigmatized they are, shows that this is a population that is not actually um, coasting or, or doing really well uh, with a lot of money and tips. First of all, you've got a population of women that our research and many other data points show has the highest rates of sexual harassment of any industry in the United States because when you get a wage of two, three, or four dollars as it is in Vermont, your wage is so low it goes entirely to taxes. You look completely off your tips. You must tolerate all kinds of inappropriate customer behavior to feed your family because of course customers are paying your bills, not your employer. Fortunately, there are seven states that have gotten rid of this system entirely. California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Minnesota, Montana, and Alaska all require the industry to pay the full minimum wage to be put on top. Our statistical regression analysis shows that these seven states have higher restaurant sales per capita, higher job growth in the restaurant industry, higher job growth among tips workers and servers, the same or higher rates of tipping, Alaska actually has the highest rates of tipping of any state in the United States, much higher than Vermont. Um, so so, so tip, tipping remains the same or equal. I think one of the, the most important data points for anybody that cares about equity is that we see one half the rate of sexual harassment in these seven states in the restaurant industry as we do in Vermont. And that is for a couple of reasons. First, it turns out when you pay a woman a full wage, like every other person in every other industry, she doesn't have to rely entirely on the kindness of strangers, on the biases of strangers to feed her family. She does get tips, but she can reject harassment. She doesn't need to tolerate harassment in order to pay her bills or feed her family at night. And these are indeed parents. Almost a third of Vermont six workers and servers are mothers. Um, so they are, their median age is around in the mid-30s. You have got a population of parents that is trying to feed their families in tips. And in these seven states, to feed their families in tips, they are not so entirely dependent on these tips. They actually get a paycheck that they can count on from their boss to feed their families. And I know um, Sarah, or Senator Sorotkin, I'm sorry, was uh, interested in knowing more about how tips are shared in these seven states. Well, it has been custom and practice for almost 40 years in these seven states that because everybody gets a minimum wage, front and back, tips are shared between front and back of house workers. That was custom and practice for 40 years. In April of last year, 2018, my organization, together with the National Employment Law Project, led a bipartisan bill in the U.S. Congress, in this Congress, um, actually winning law that makes it now legal for any restaurant in the country that does pay what we call one fair wage, a full minimum wage, to front and back of house workers, to servers, bartenders, and back of house, making it legal for these restaurants to share tips between all workers in the restaurant. This practice of sharing tips between front and back dramatically reduces sexual harassment because it spreads the incentive of the tip to all workers the men in the back, largely the, the industry is very segregated by gender and race, and in our case, the front of the house that largely relies on tips is mostly female, the back of the house is not. When you spread the incentive of the tip among both men and women, it dramatically reduces the power dynamic between men and women and the sexual harassment that exists between men and women in the kitchen and the dining room staff. The sharing the tips is something that our 770 restaurant companies that agree with us on this issue have long fought for, have long asked for, that they be able to share tips if they pay the full minimum wage. And we made that law, the federal law, in April 2018. So if these seven states have been able to do this so successfully, uh, require this industry to pay the full minimum wage like every other minimum wage, we said, uh, like every other industry, I'm sorry, he said, well, if these seven states can do it, certainly all 50 states and Congress can do this, require this industry to pay the full minimum wage. 
Um, we've been working on this issue for several years, and last year got an enormous uplift with Me Too and Time's Up. Um, there were 400 media outlets that published our research, including the New York Times, which did a huge cover story on the issue and our research, the Washington Post, and it was featured on 60 Minutes, 2020, and Bill Maher. And as a result of all of that, we are seeing this year 18 states uh, introduce legislation to fully eliminate the lower wage for tip workers, as well as Congress. Um, this bill has been introduced in Congress every single year. The bill is to raise the minimum wage for 15 and fully eliminate the lower wage for tip workers. Um, the, the Democrats that lead that the bill in, in, the, in, in Congress have supported full elimination of the lower wage for tipped workers for the last several years. And this year, uh, they are actually moving very quickly to pass it in the first 100 days in the House. Uh, and so this issue will pass in the House of Representatives at the federal level this year within the first 100 days of Congress. And it is likely to pass in several other states. It's moving uh, quite fast in New York and Illinois. And as I said, it's been moving and introduced in another 16 states across the country. So there's tremendous momentum to eliminate this legacy of slavery and reduce sexual harassment. And it couldn't come fast enough because in December, something very, very important happened that everybody in the room really needs to know about, but unfortunately, very few people do know about, which is that President Trump and the Trump Department of Labor in December announced that they were rescinding all regulation and enforcement surrounding the two-tier wage system. What does that mean? Until December, there were strict rules that said you could only pay the sub-minimum wage to tip workers, that lower minimum wage, if those workers interacted with customers 80% of the time. It was called the 80-20 rule. And that is because if you don't interact with customers, you not, do not have the opportunity to earn tips, and therefore don't have the opportunity to ensure that tips bring you to the full minimum wage. Well, that rule was completely rescinded by the federal government in December. They also rescinded all enforcement, all federal enforcement, of any rules surrounding the two-tier wage system. So many of you know it is federal law, it has been since 1938, that people can be paid the sub-minimum wage as long as tips bring them to the full minimum wage. All federal enforcement of employers ensuring that tips bring you to the full minimum wage is gone. And immediately after that rule and all federal enforcement was rescinded, IHOP announced to all of its workers that they would all be receiving a sub-minimum wage in every state that allowed for a sub-minimum wage, every state, 43 states, including Vermont, regardless of what task they were doing. So now workers who sold napkins or stock glassware or are doing things that have nothing to do with interacting with customers or getting tips are paid the sub-minimum wage because there is no longer any incentive from the federal government to actually pay anybody the full minimum wage. So if you in Vermont proceed to, to uh, create or maintain a two-tier wage system, you are effectively actually only passing a lower minimum wage. Because, so for example, if you decide to go to $15 and leave tipped workers behind at 50%, which would be $7.50, you would be effectively passing a minimum wage in Vermont of $7.50 because there is no incentive whatsoever anymore from the federal government to actually have employers pay full minimum wage. There's one more reason to really uh, consider this very strongly in Vermont, and when I say consider this, I mean consider an amendment that would want not only have everybody else in the state go to 15, but tipped workers as well. We're proposing that it happen over a very slow time period. Nobody's asking if restaurants to go from four or five or six to 15 overnight. It would be at most a dollar or a little over a dollar a year. That is how it's being proposed and moved in every other state and in Congress. Um, so that is a proposal. There's another reason to strongly consider that in Vermont. Vermont has a very strong business fairness law, and we've been working with national attorneys at the ACLU and other folks at the national level to examine this law and see that there is a real legal argument to say that it is completely unfair to ask plenty of very small businesses, businesses in Vermont to save up to $15 and allow restaurants, including very large multinational corporations like Denny's and IHOP and Applebee's, to continue to pay a sub-minimum wage 
in small businesses like hardware stores and small flower shops and other retail stores in Vermont are going to be asked to go to 15. It's unfair to other businesses to ask them to go to 15 and that this one industry gets an exemption simply because of a historical legacy of slavery uh, and because of the politics of the, the lobbying of the restaurant association. So we would strongly argue uh, that there's plenty of data that we can provide Vermont specific data that shows that in order to lift uh, tens of uh, over uh, at this point about 12,000 women in Vermont out of poverty in order to cut sexual harassment in half uh, in order to follow what most states are moving towards and, and the House of Representatives are moving towards in order to correct the horrible rule and, and rule rescission that was just enforced by the Trump Department of Labor um, there should be an amendment to include tipped workers uh, in the overall minimum wage increase that you are putting forward we, okay, good, perfect timing. Uh, thank you. We've got a few more minutes. Uh, when I started out, I asked you if you would talk about the overall raise of the minimum wage to $15 and not exclusively talk about tip wages. Do you have anything to add about the I'm so sorry, I didn't hear you say that. You I, I, I did not hear you say that initially. Oh, okay. Do you, um, have, do you have anything to say? Advice. Do you have anything to say? Do you have anything to say about raising the minimum wage to $15? She did. Absolutely. Um, the restaurant industry, as I said, is the largest and fastest growing industry in America, in the um, and, and, the, and the lowest paying. We are the largest workforce of minimum wage workers in the United States. And so I'm sure you've heard in testimony so many other good reasons to raise the overall minimum wage. In our industry, it is absolutely imperative for a couple of reasons. You must raise the overall minimum wage to ensure that you don't have a mass proliferation of the absolute lowest paying jobs in the country, taking us from a nation of one in three working Americans working full time and living in poverty to almost one in two. We are getting very close to almost one in two working Americans working full time and living in poverty. And that increase from one in three to one in two is almost entirely the explosive growth of the lowest wage sectors in the United States, namely the restaurant industry. Our industry needs this increase. We are going through the worst labor shortage in the history of the industry in Vermont and in every state in the United States. And that is largely because workers cannot afford to live on these wages anymore. And so to support the very industry itself, we need to see all wages rise for workers in Vermont. 15 is the minimum that it can go to in order for workers to survive, uh, but that means all workers, including tips workers in this industry. So, uh, a couple more questions. Um, Very much. Are back of the house people generally in the restaurant industry considered tipped employee? They are not. Uh, they are they are non tipped employees. So. Um, they would go up if you excluded tipped workers. Their wages would generally go up. But what I'm trying to explain is what happened in December with the Trump Department of Labor. I was going to ask that question next because I didn't fully understand that that happened. It sounds like it's exacerbating the problem. So could you just revisit that December change? Sure. So uh, in December, and I can send you a legal memo on this. That that would be helpful. Yes, I'll, I'll, I did send it uh, earlier, but I'll read, I'll read for it. Um, in December, President Trump rescinded what's known as the 80-20 rule. It's a rule that says if you are going to be paid to come in, I'm sorry, I'm just going to move out of the front in this one. Can we still see me? <laughs> yes, lovely. Um, in December, uh, until December, there was a rule called the 80-20 rule that said that the only workers that could be paid the sub-minimum wage are those that interact with customers 80% of the time. That was to ensure that they would have the opportunity to earn the tips that they need to actually get them to the full minimum wage. Um, by the way, prior to December, the Obama Department of Labor had already done a very thorough investigation of the issue and found an 84% violation of the rules surrounding the fit minimum, the two-tiered wage system. So let me be clear. When we have full enforcement, one of the best 
administration's enforcement of any administration we've seen in the last 50 years, and we had full enforcement of this issue. We saw an 84% violation rate with regard to restaurants following the rules surrounding the two-tiered wage system. But at least there, was rule, there were rules and there was some enforcement. In December, all of those rules and enforcement were rescinded. In December, the 80-20 rule that says that workers who get the sub-minimum wage must interact with customers 80% of the time was rescinded. Uh, at this point, to answer your question, that means the only incentive for employers to pay the full minimum wage to workers in restaurants is market forces. Market forces prevent employers from paying kitchen staff the sub-minimum wage because it's very hard to find kitchen staff. Market forces keep them at a higher minimum wage, but there's no legal enforcement anymore right. of a restaurant actually having to pay the full minimum wage uh, from coming from the federal government. There are some state laws in Vermont that protect these workers, but the 80-20 rule is not among them. There is no state law that protects workers saying that they must interact with customers 80% of the time. So legally, legally, there's no actual incentive for restaurants to pay anybody the full, the full minimum wage. So, but market forces prevent restaurants from paying the back of house uh, anything less than the full minimum wage. They do not prevent them from getting tipped workers to do lots of work that is non-tipped. So a very good example of this is IHOP, which has already moved to having workers doing non-tipped work, setting up tables, stocking glassware, folding napkins, tip, uh, work that does not get them tipped and still paying on the sub-minimum wage. So does that, does that answer your question? A little bit. So we have evidence with IHOP that they're, they're paying back of the house people sub-minimum wage? Not back of house. That's what I was saying. Back of house, there are market forces that prevent... Well, well people who are folding, the, the people you described folding okay. down. So what we call front of house workers, uh, they could be bussers, servers, runners, anybody, but they could be doing non-tipped work, right. uh, not receiving tips, and still receive the sub-minimum wage. Right, they could. Do you have reports and studies that show that's what IHOP is doing? I mean, this real change just happened in December, so what we do have is workers coming to us and telling us, IHOP is telling us this. Okay. Um, so we can share that information. Okay. We can create a memo for you sharing, okay. we've heard this from yeah. workers, this is what we've heard. Okay. But it's been about a month. In, ter in terms of Vermont law, my understanding is that... Just speak up the mic. My understanding is that the law says if you don't make up the full minimum wage you, and the employer pays a tipped minimum wage of half, it's the employer's duty to make up the difference. So it, maybe there are no regulations or implement, implementing procedures that help guarantee that, but are you aware of in Vermont, do we have any studies or information that people are not getting what the law requires. Yes, um, so, so first of all, uh, that's actually federal law. It's not just state law. Well, it's, it's, federal law it's in the state state law as well. It is state law as well, but actually our research and data shows that um, there have been far more resources in terms of federal enforcement until December. After December, all federal enforcement of that rule is gone. And so the only protection for workers at this time is any state enforcement of that rule, which has not been enough. In fact, with the combination of state and federal enforcement, what I told you is that there was an 84% violation rate of this rule. Right. So with, now with the rescission of all federal enforcement, it's going to see an even higher violation rate. But the problem is that even, we, so we saw a 16% uh, compliance rate with the best enforcement in the world. But even if we had a 100% compliance rate, you still have an almost 80% female population having to tolerate all kinds of inappropriate customer behavior to feed their family and tips. And yes, we do have information on Vermont workers experiencing wage theft and tip theft and sexual harassment. We're actually gathering much more of that in the next couple of weeks, uh, reflecting surveys of workers in the state on these issues. One of the sources of data that, that shows that we know that this is not true is that we do have the percentage of workers, we do have 
a substantial percentage of workers in government data that are earning less than the minimum wage uh, in the restaurant industry, and those are workers who, whose tips do not bring them to the full minimum wage. Uh, one final question, and then maybe there's a couple from the committee. We talk a lot about restaurant workers getting sub-minimum. What is the situation with hospitality workers, chambermaids? I know they sometimes, not as much as restaurant people will get tips, but uh, are they, is the hospitality industry in general paying their chambermaids the sub-minimum, or are they paying them the full minimum? I'm so glad you asked that because in Vermont, you've got a little over 10,000 workers in the restaurant industry that are tipped, but you've got a total of over 12,000 tipped workers. So the majority are, of course, in the restaurant industry, and they're not just servers and bartenders. They're buffers and runners and delivery workers. Um, but non-tipped workers in the, in, um, who are not, I mean, sorry, tipped workers who are not in the restaurant industry include nail salons, car wash, airport valets, hairdressers. Um, they do not generally include chambermaids and hotels. Generally, chambermaids and hotels are paid the full minimum wage for tips on top uh, because that sector is more heavily unionized nationally and they've created a market standard that actually requires what the wage was always intended to be for tip workers, a full wage with tips on top. But for these other vulnerable workers, restaurant workers, nail salon, car wash, hairdressers, airport valets, they've been excluded from the minimum wage entirely. So it just shows that the hotel industry can do it. Certainly they have six workers, but they're paid the full minimum wage. There's just no reason why restaurants can't as well. And again, nobody's asking them to do that overnight. The proposal would be to phase them in over a long period of time to get to the full minimum wage. What are the phasing periods in the states that have recently passed this? Um, you know, they've been anywhere from eight, nine, ten, sometimes ten years. Okay. Generally, what we recommend is somewhere from a dollar to a dollar fifty increase per year, just as you're doing for the overall minimum wage. Uh, same, you know, slow, methodical process for tip workers. Anybody else have any questions? Yes. I do. So, so it's lovely to see you again. Um, the question I have for you is is one that I've actually gotten a couple of people have asked me as we talk about this. Um, what is the compliance rate on full reporting of tips? Because, um, you know, it's, um, I'm just curious if you know what that is. Yeah, I mean, it's very hard to know at, at yeah. the, with regard to, to that. But I would just say that the data that, you know, oftentimes the opposition says uh, these workers, uh, they must make a lot more than government right. that telling us because their tips are not reported. The data that I'm referring to is actually not worker-reported data. It is uh, it's called OES, Occupational Employment Statistics from the Bureau of Labor Statistics of the Department of Labor. It's actually employer-reported payroll data. Employer-reported payroll data. So either if the Restaurant Association or the Chamber is saying, well, this government data is not true, right? Like the, is underreporting, then either they're lying to the government when they report their payroll data, or they're not telling the truth now when they're saying that's not the right data. But, you know, the best data that we have is employer reported payroll data with regard to BART, you know, tipped workers, tips and wages. Um, that's one thing I would say. The other thing I would say is even if you want to argue how much tipped workers make in Vermont and say, we can't say because they don't report their tips, and employers maybe are lying when they report payroll data, even if you want to say all of that, the part that's undeniable is the use of food stamps and public assistance. Oh. I mean, you know, it, it, yeah. it is incredibly difficult and stigmatized to get food stamps. You don't do that if you're a highly tipped server and you want extra money to go skiing. You know, you do that because you're a single mother and you need money to, to actually get food for your children. So the fact that servers in Vermont are 80% female, almost a third mom, right. use food stamps at double the rate of the rest of the U.S. workforce should tell us something regardless of what you want to say about how much they're actually earning. Right. And do you have any Vermont-specific data um, on how many people are working in and I don't even know what the fine line is here between a restaurant where uh, you actually get 
fairly good tips and 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 low cost sort of diners where you're not going to make as much in tips because they're you know as we were doing this in the last couple of years you know you sort of anecdotally ask people and and people at Jay Morgan's across the street that do incredibly well in tips and um, it's not an issue for them it's an issue in large measure for you have a tipping point as it were for a, a meal cost below which tips really uh, don't necessarily always bring it up. Right. Uh, you know, I don't, the tipping point in other places is uh, actually, we say anything less than 35 or 40 in a place like New York is uh, casual, but it's going to be very different for uh, 35 or 40, meaning that's the full meal ticket for a customer, including meals, uh, drinks, packs, all of Got that. It. But that is, that is very different for, for Vermont and actually very different depending on the region of Vermont. I will tell you the vast majority of workers in Vermont, and again, we can share the government data, are do work in casual restaurants, not fine dining. I mean, that right. is true across the country. Fine dining is a very small sliver of the overall industry. It's less than 15 or 20 percent of all jobs are in fine dining. The vast majority of workers work in I have Denny's, Applebee's, roadside diners, small mom and pop restaurants. And again, that is what the median wages are showing us, is that these right. are workers who are living in poverty. Um, the other thing I will say is, though, even for that server that's making a lot of money at Shea Morgan, or I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name, um, that, that, is, that is very uh, unpredictable and seasonal, and um, it can also be very, very variable. We've had a number of workers in fine dining restaurants tell us, you know, we live for a particular part of the year, and the rest of the year is just it's so variable. I might earn $0 tonight or $200 tomorrow. There's lots of problems, even for those workers. Not only can they not save, nor can they predict, you know, can they make the rent this month if there's a blizzard or some kind of other right. weather problem. Uh, they're, 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 they might go to work, but very few customers will show up, and so they'll make far less than this. They cannot plan. Worst of all, we find uh, it definitely impacts their ability to have credit, buy home, you know, save, have Social Security. I mean, if your 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 on the record wage forever has been four or five dollars, what do you get in terms of Social Security at the end of your life? Almost nothing. Um, so, so there are a number of problems, even for those workers, because of the unpredictability of income that we receive from the way. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to have to cut you off. We have a whole okay. series, series of witnesses, and thank you. We really appreciate uh, your testifying by Skype and the depth of your knowledge. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank we'll see you soon. Bye. We hope. <coughs> Great dipper comes in. That was great. And, um, okay, Mark Fryer. I think we're going to try. Do you need some help moving this out of the room? Uh, I, no, we can yeah, help. Over okay. Good idea. <laughs> Brilliant idea. I apologize. I didn't get a chance to collate everything out, but there's three different parts. Okay. Yeah. Take your head off and stay a while. What's each? It's a little cold out there. Yeah. yeah take one. So, yeah. You want that? Let me know. Should I just get into it while you guys are passing out, or do you want me to wait? Um, I, I won't get into the I'll numbers really yeah. until halfway through, anyways. But I did bring some. Okay. Why don't you just go for it? Cheryl kindly is cold. Cold waiting. Um, I've been here before, and I appreciate uh, being invited back to talk about um, my stance and what I'm seeing in the industry. My name is Mark Fryer. Um, I own the Reservoir Restaurant, which opened in 2009. I opened the Bench Restaurant in Stowe in 2014, and I, uh, in 2017, opened Trace Amigos at the Rusty Nail Stage in Stowe. Um, I'm also a select board member in Waterbury, and I sit on the board of the Stowe Area Association, and also the Waterbury Area Development Committee. Um, I, it's difficult to necessarily estimate, but I have a approximately at any one time around 150 employees and that's a mixture of full-time and part-time. Um, knowing that minimum wage is being discussed and the different options surrounding it, my goal would be to raise minimum wage to a livable wage, decouple tip wage, and increase compliance requirements and enforcement, and I'll explain why. 
Um, mainly it's to protect the server and bartender wages that I know that my employees currently receive and also knowing that I represent a large majority of the industry um, in the areas that I serve. Um, many of my employees earn very livable wages well in excess of the current goal of $15 an hour. Many are parents, homeowners, and female as stated before. Um, so most of what I'm going to talk about is tipped wage, um, which a lot of what was just discussed, there are elements of it that I believe are true, but I, I, I disagree with a lot of it, and I don't think the data is being presented accurately and fairly, uh, partially because we're talking about Vermont. I, my business is in Vermont. I've been in business in the restaurant industry for about 10 years in total with all of them, close to 15. Um, Who's asking to eliminate tipping? Is it the servers or restaurant owners of Vermont? I think as a business owner, I'd probably make more money. And I think that's why many are quiet. I think there's a, a, a model that is happening which, and, and I, I'm surprised to even hear it in the, the previous testimony of this idea that tips would ever be shared to the back of the house. Um, the models that have gone to a full wage the restaurants now are, are charging a service charge, sometimes up to the 20%. It looks on a, on your receipt as a uh, as a basically a forced tip, but that's not a tip. That's something that the owner can take and decide how to disperse the money. It changes it. And I'll, and I'll show you why, when, when you get into the income for my employees, why that scares me. Um, why decouple, by decoupling, by coupling tip wages we currently do, all servers, no matter what their final take-home gross wages, receives an increase every year to their non-tip wage base. The law currently states that anyone making less than full minimum wage after tips is required to be compensated by the employer to at least match current non-tip wage. Why would we have a law that gives an automatic raise to employees that are well above minimum wage, in my case, over $20 an hour, when they're not asking for it, and it's, and it's not working as a real minimum wage because it's, it's increasing their wages. By coupling, you're inflating an entire industry which is creating an additional financial burden that is unnecessary. Most likely this was not on many employers' radars because years ago it wasn't a big number, but as we talk about going to 15 and that increase, um, I show here one of the restaurants um, had 18,000 hours of tip labor in 2018. A single dollar increase is about $18,000 in cost to an employer, which we most likely would then increase prices, which would increase tips. Um, that $5 to $15, which would be $10 an hour, I use the 2016 just for easy numbers, um, would be an increase of almost $200,000 in additional labor costs, currently wiping out pretty much our profits. This does not include, include the cost of the labor for the back of the house or what we would expect of the cost of goods increase. I've, I've testified before that I think there's a, a big trend, which I, I love, which is trying to buy local in restaurants. Um, but when, they, when those businesses that we're buying from, whether it's a brewery or a food provider, has, have increased costs, they're most likely gonna raise their prices to adjust accordingly. And, that most likely will mean that we need to raise prices to adjust for the cost of goods without necessarily making any more money. Um, work to increase the minimum. I believe that we should definitely be working towards increasing the minimum wage. Um, the back of the house discrepancy for front of house is, is huge and you'll see in a minute how large that is. Um, minimum wage increases cost, cost of goods to go increase, restaurants most likely raise. Um, tipped employees should expect to see an increase as tips are a percentage of price. So if we need to raise our menu prices, most likely tips will see an increase because they tend to typically set the same percentage. So you would expect that front of house workers as we would be making adjustments for minimum wage increases for our increased cost in the back of house and our cost of goods, you would expect that front of house workers would make more because we would have to take price. Um, I read through some of the documentation and addressing some of the things that I just heard from the, the previous um, uh, testifying. Um, poverty. First of all, I'd, I'd be interested to understand if it's true in Vermont for restaurant workers. 
if the state focused on compliance and raising non-tip minimum wage to a livable wage, why would we mess with the wages I'm going to present that are well above the short-term goals? Um, one of the things I, I noticed when I was putting together one of the things I noticed when I was putting together the data for my restaurants for my front of house workers, I noticed that you don't report hours. On a W-2, it says how much you made, gross, and then it breaks it down to your base wage and tips. It doesn't say hours, so you can't even calculate hourly wage from that data. So you would have to go to a restaurant and get that data. Um, and then difficulty of compliance. Is this a problem in Vermont? Why? Could we require employers to state real hourly wages on pay stubs, clearly showing final take-home wage, include minimum wage and a phone number to complain to the state discreetly? Rooms and meals are supplying millions of dollars in revenue to the state. Could we put some of that money towards policing policy? Um, there was another mention of lawsuits. I asked how many are, have there been in Vermont? I've never heard of one. Personally, an employer not I'm not concerned. A couple of bad apples uprooting an industry that's created thousands of livable wage jobs in a state struggling to create jobs and attract young employers. The 80-20 rule, again, is this a problem in Vermont? Have we heard have we heard enough to say that employees think that this is a problem? I think there's a there is an expectation that there's a certain amount of work that's done prior to you opening the restaurant, and even while you're open, there's there's work of folding glassware or, I mean, folding napkins or cleaning glassware. I think there's a certain expectation that that's part of the job, but as you'll see, wages are still, it's not a large part hourly in terms of the hours that they do it, but it's a, I don't know how you would do it otherwise. Sometimes it's in the middle of the shift. Um, if you, would that require you to clock out, clock in. I just, I don't really understand how it would work. Um, in terms of so any, look, me, just, yeah. There's a little confusion on this 80 20 rule. So basically that was saying it's no longer being enforced or in effect, but before it used to say, before you could qualify a worker for a sub, for a tip minimum wage, you had to. You had to have 80% of your time had to be interaction with the customer, I believe is what, how I understood it. Right. So it would allow us. It would allow you to tip into the kitchen because they're not interacting with the customer eighty percent of their time. Eighty percent interacting with the customer. Well, probably even the most experienced waiter or waiter doesn't do that. Yeah. They're bringing stuff back and forth and they're spending a few seconds. But that's part of interacting if you're bringing them their meal. Yeah, I would. I would argue that it's. It's you know. That's one table, then they go over to another table, they're ringing in the, I mean, I think that's okay. all part of you. If they're going, you ring in the order. I mean, that's all part of that job. I wouldn't say that that doesn't necessarily fall under. They're serving the customer at that point. So, but would you say in fairness that um, most restaurant tours like yourself, if the person is in your mind a waiter, that's what they do because they're the only place that serve the table. And you don't even think about the 80 20 rule, so that's a way that they get the lower wage. Yeah, I think the only time that maybe we think about it is how much we might ask of the server to do things maybe before we open or at the end of the night. You know, there, you have to, there's certain parts of picking up the restaurant, clearing tables, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, we, we consciously are thinking of that as there are times that we bring in out. We have outside cleaning crews that come in and clean separately from the service. It's that kind of stuff that I think certain restaurants have pushed the limits on how much they ask the servers to do basically when the business is open. Do you have any people in your place where you, some of their hours are at minimum wage, some of their hours are at tip minimum wage? Not for servers. Unless they take a role that's not a server role, they get it. They get minimum wage. So like a food runner gets minimum wage plus tips. But it's, they're still at minimum wage because we couldn't argue. Personally, we wouldn't want to try to argue the 80-20 rule on that. Yeah. Are your tips pulled? No, we don't We don't pull tips each. He has a whole thing on tips. Yeah. yeah, so basically for tip pulling, plenty of restaurants do it. We don't. Um, but there are clear rules that need to be followed, one of which is that each server is supposed to get 85% of the tips they received back. So there's a certain percentage of that that says you can take that money and give it to the auxiliary um, you know, support staff, food runners, 
um, drink runners. Um, but again, could we do this through more audits and compliance and not necessarily up, upend what's happening in Vermont? Um, sexual harassment, I, I think you had asked if there are specific numbers on for, to Vermont. Um, I have plenty of females that work for me in the front of house and I don't think they do it because they don't, they're putting themselves in a, a situation that they're being harassed. Um, I think, correct. May I just say, yeah, have, sure. you, have you actually surveyed them in a, in a, an anonymous, I mean, do you actually know that? I mean, because well, my we've guess had is harassment so much, problems, so but sometimes it's not necessarily has to do with tipping at all. I think it's literally just uh, males that are. I mean, just ugly behavior? Yeah, ugly behavior, right? And we've, as man, as, a, as an owner and a manager, I would, I would think that my employees have an expectation that we would address that professionally and quickly and appropriately. And from a business standpoint, we would, I think that the era of the 1980s, whatever happened, I don't know, whatever happened in the past, I don't believe that these are jobs that are putting females in positions that A, aren't making solid wages, but also I don't feel like they're being put in a situation where they feel like they have to overly perform as a female to make these wages. I think it's known that I have plenty of employees that have children that are single moms and own homes. They do these jobs because they can make a significant amount of money in a short period of time and get home to their families. And I'll show you that. I think we should go to that right now anyways because I'm about to talk about the numbers. So I gave you an appendix which shows the three restaurants that Can I, I just interject oh, for sure. a and just say, it's also possible that they are putting up with a whole lot because they know they have to put up with a whole lot. Right. And they may not actually feel comfortable talking to you about that. So I just right. want to like I, I, own yeah, that I, and I understand I, I, what you're saying. I understand the position. And so it is, um, I don't know if you actually do. And so because your testimony is leading me to believe that because they haven't come to you personally, they might not be dealing with on a regular basis. As someone who worked as a cocktail waitress, who worked as a busser, who worked in front of the house, I can tell you, I never went to my boss to complain about it because that was just part of the deal. So I just I just need to bring it I, into the I, conversation. And I, and I believe that that is true. Thank I you. I believe that is true. Thank um, you. That's all my, I wanted my to question would be is was the changes true. to tip, the, the proposed so changes to tip wage are going to a one wage. I would question whether or not that would fix some of the issues that And that's that fine. We can disagree yeah, on policy. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Fine. Okay, yeah. I, I apologize. I didn't, I didn't mean it that, that way. I, I do believe it exists. Um, but I do want to show that I, I feel like it's being made out to that it's not a good job for females. I think that's my point that I want to make is that these wages are, to me, very healthy. And I think that that's an important thing that I, I'm trying to protect. I'm here saying you can make some of these changes and I would make right. more money. And my female employees will make less money, and that's that's a concern I have. So noted. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I think actually that's your that's a major piece of your yeah because obviously we would want to understand how, last year. how would, this would work, and and I will talk real numbers. I I have presented the real numbers that I have from my restaurant. So these are the 2018 numbers. Um, restaurant one, 17 females um, that are in tip wage, seven males. Uh, the average female wage, 27.66. The average male wage, 23.42. So you're on the last appendix. Yeah, appendix A restaurant. And are these, uh, are, your, are your workers characteristically full-time or part-time? Well, that's that's where we get back to the question of, let's take, I, I don't exactly understand. I know there are benefits cliffs, and we, we see employees that they have the option to say how many hours they want to work. So they could come in and make $40 an hour, and once they've hit where they want to make wage-wise, they just don't work extra hours. Which for me, there's the other part of it, which is the mothers that work for me can work three days a week, make wages that work for their life and lifestyle and their children, and these are these are these are the real wages that they're making. This is directly off of yeah, the W two. It's hard for me to translate the hours. The, uh, how many of your front of house staff work full time? Uh, 40 hours a week. Very rarely 40 hours a week. Unless it's bartenders more often do 40 hours a week, but the servers typically will work three what, to yeah, four days a, a week. Give us a notion of what they typically work. Three to four days a week, eight hour shifts, so whatever that is. 
So like twenty four to thirty hours. Yeah, I would say I would say go up to thirty five, but rarely are they working. And actually, when I was working last night, you're still required to pay um, if they do work over forty hours a week. There's a uh, you're still required to make that one point five times payment. It was like one hundred and seventy dollars on the payroll of three hundred or four hundred thousand. So very rarely was anyone working. Uh, so you don't you rarely have to make up the difference. Yes. Yeah. Well, not making up the difference. That is, you're okay. still required to pay time and a half if they went over forty hours oh, on right. that to tip minimum wage. So that to me said no one's working forty hours a week very often because we rarely ever made that. Are these all waiters and waitresses? Yes. Yeah. These are only waiters and waitresses. I was hoping that I could actually separate out bartender, but the way that our payroll service does it, all tipped wage goes into one bucket. So I can't then go back and say, this is for server, this is bartenders, but I don't know if that's necessarily that important. So, to, well, to if separate. you look at the number of hours uh, on a list, if a person were working 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, they'd be working 2,080 hours. Yes. And so as a result, you can see from this chart, all of these are substantially less than full-time position. One comes to 1,900, which right, is but nowhere does close. it tell us what the, is it the, for the whole year? This is, is for, for 2018. Is it for what? That's I don't know. It's 2018. So this is for the whole year? Whole year, yep. And again, I don't know if some of these employees only work for part time of the year. I, yeah, I could go through and say who's currently working for me, but some of these employees have come and gone. Uh, we re we retain quite a few employees because of the wages. So I would say restaurant two is a great example. There's a significant number of females at this restaurant that I know that have been with me almost from the beginning. Um, so and so your churn is your turnover rate is fairly low. Well, restaurant three, the turnover rate is a little higher, <laughs> but we're trying to work on that. But also, um, just from all of this, and, and I'd also love to know the difference between what bartenders and waiters make. Do bartenders tend to make more? Are they on the I think highest? it depends on what uh, what kind of restaurant or bar you're in. In mine, I would say that the servers make more than the bartenders. And it's kind of examples on restaurant three. I, one that says music venue under the first male, that's uh, a bartender only. That's where actually you start to see some lowers, lowering in the averages because in that in that restaurant we have a music venue that there are certain people that only uh, take bartender positions um, instead of servers. Um, but I mean the other important thing for me to note is restaurant three. I'm losing money. I'm probably upside down six figures a year right now, and I can still offer take home wages that average 28 and $22 an hour. So even though I'm not making money right now and I can luckily support that restaurant with the other two, um, that doesn't affect my employees and it doesn't force me to close the doors yet. Um, that's an important thing to talk about as we talk about potentially increasing wages in, in a big way to employers and how they would adjust quickly enough and, and hopefully the customers would still support them at the higher price point. So I'm just curiosity, I'm trying to understand the level sure. playing field with these three restaurants. Um, is level, are they all of the same age? Which is the oldest restaurant? So which one has been around longest? Yeah, and has I, best it's at the amount? beginning of is, my testimony. So sorry, is restaurant, restaurant one is the oldest. Uh, that's about 10 years old. Right, so this makes sense in that restaurant three is the newest. Restaurant three is the newest and so, restaurant two is the so it may take some time for restaurant three to. Yeah, hope, yeah, well, we're hoping we'll, we'll figure yeah. it out. Yeah. <laughs> and um, are these all the same level of. Yeah, I would say um, very rarely anything on the menu is more than twenty dollars for food, and um, beers range from anywhere from four to eight dollars or seven dollars. So a medium. Yeah. yeah, I would say a medium level restaurant. I think when you get into fine dining, you'll find that the numbers might be slightly higher, but what will happen is you'll wait on less tables, but the, the dollars and cents come out to you know, somewhat similar. They're, they might see a little bit higher. Um, so I'll get back to, can I answer any other questions on the data that I presented? Okay. It's very fulsome, thank you. Um, and you understand why my concern that I want to protect these wages, and, mm -hmm. and, I, and I truly believe that the other model will hurt these Okay, so we'll get to that because yeah, I don't understand the reason why that. But why is it that female waitresses are more than male waitresses? I don't know. 
I, I would potentially argue that they give better service. But, but basically you're paying, are you, I'm not paying, paying them any differently right. per hour. They they're get the tips. tips. They're making more tips. Okay, they're making more tips. Yeah. And if you look at the, at the ones who are, if you look at the same hours roughly and try and get somebody paired, fit, male, female, that is consistent. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I, was a little, I don't look at this data very often, right? <laughs> it's not something that... So the... Yeah. Especially knowing, you know, I just know that we offer um, a job that can create a very livable wage in Vermont. Um, I know that I'm not forced at any point to pay that tipped credit to get them to minimum wage because they're well above it. So I would notice that as so, I'm trying to so run. So you can't, uh, other than tips, you can't identify any characteristic like your female waitresses have been there longer or more. I see or longer get, attention for females. Do they get better hours? Do they get better shifts? The ones that have been there longer have the lunchtime. first choice on shifts. So I would say um, just because I have a large female staff at each restaurant and the retainment of that tends to be that the, the yes, they probably are at times on better shifts. Okay, and so one other very fundamental question in terms of tax reporting, you have their number, their dollar value these are all so what is presented to the state and federally as income so that's okay. all taxed okay. but it, which but it all but it first goes to you and you report it to the correct. state correct yes so, so they, they, they have, have to report, their they have to report their, every day when they at our restaurant when they are done it presents them with their credit card tips and mm. and credit cards have made so we know they've possible. made credit cards, which right now I would estimate is around 80 to 90% of so the business more depending on the restaurant. Right. Um, exactly. So from there, if they say none, they're basically saying they're getting cash tips. So we keep an eye on that and we have an expectation that we see a reporting of above that to a certain extent. But it is, cash is difficult, but I would say it's a very small part of what, what these wages are these days. I think that, you know, of course, there are restaurants that deal in cash. But there are businesses that deal in cash too, so I think cash always makes it difficult to, deal with, to track money. If I write a twenty-five dollar tip, and several different waiters and waitresses come over to my table in the course of the day, how, do, how does that? Did you never wait tables, Mr. Chair? I pay a lot. That's where. Um, <laughs> I think when you see that happening at a restaurant, they are probably tip pool to share. At our restaurant, most likely from the beginning of service down to service, you have a single server, and they are receiving the initial tip, and then there is, you know, small under the fifteen percent tip out to support staff. But that's how that works. Um, if you see, if you, I just had so it last go, night. Go into that fifteen percent. Sure. Of that ten dollar tip. Dollar fifty will be not reported as their wages, and, and you will figure out a way to get that dollar fifty to. It would be yeah. reported, yeah, as under the other employee okay. as tipped so, also. Yes. Okay. So after you mentioned that you don't, you rarely have to make up that difference, how how do you check this? I mean, how frequently do you? Have well, to it's every payroll. The payroll service by law has to has to prove within the data that they made hourly minimum wage. And if we didn't, um, I actually saw it a couple times and I'm sure it probably happened where it was someone who came and went very quickly, say they only worked a shift. But I did see it in like a $20 a year or something like that where we we needed to make up for that. But it's an automatic within payroll services that that, that math is calculated and I believe it's an every two week pay period if you are not averaging minimum wage, the employer has to make up that difference. Um, the other nice thing about these wages at my businesses is they walk with their money every night. There's no there's no risk that if I were to not run my business well that they wouldn't end up with the money that they're owed from payroll. Tom just mentioned to me, Tom Stevens mentioned to me that there's a restaurant that I guess went under and the money to the servers that should have gone from tips that was coming in a paycheck never came. So in, in our scenario, they walk every night with their money um, and then we withhold uh, basically what's owed for taxes, which is pretty close to what tip, tip to minimum wage is. So there's a lot of, the employees see it as a zero paycheck. They really don't even think about what that number is. They think it's money they don't make, but really it's the taxes that, that we're withholding.
So if 95% of your tips come from credit cards, and you're saying they walk with their money. We give them the money before we've actually them received them. Cash. Every night. We Every receive night. that money two okay. to three days later, okay. usually. Right, but so to yeah. his point earlier, yeah. which I think is a good one, 20 years ago, many more of the tips were in cash. Right, right, right. right. But so now you have, a, you have a check to see, like, did they really, were they able to make yeah. the minimum wage for that shift? So, so. So I'll, I'll continue down on my, um, so why keep tipping? I think it keeps menu prices down. It allows for higher wages, um, as I'll make the argument that I think that if we went the other way, I think wages would, would go down, especially on the higher and mid-level um, wage earners. Um, and right now it's it's creating livable, livable wages in the state. Why, um, why, why do you think it would go down? But if, if you sort of paying sure. $10 versus $5, why do you think the customer would pay any less? I think restaurants are going to start to look at service charge models where they build a tip into something called a service charge. I'm already starting to see little 2% service charges at restaurants. There's one in Montpelier, there's one in Waterbury. Um, one of the restaurants in, I believe in San Francisco that did this, they basically put the $20 service charge, the restaurant's taking a 15% rake right off the top of it, and then they're their employees are in 17 to $31 an hour, but the, em the employer picks that. And I think what happens is, say we went to a model where I had to quickly, and I say quickly, I would hope that you wouldn't do this in a year. Um, I would have to quickly figure out how to make my business model work for uh, paying $15 an hour for front of house staff. Um, well, right now that, that tipped that tipped amount from a customer makes up that wage. So I, I would either have to take it in price or I would add a service charge. Uh, I think most people would try to do a service charge to keep menu prices low. But once it becomes a service charge, employers can divvy out that money as they see fit. So what, what this restaurant in particular is doing is they're taking 15% off the top. I don't know what they're doing with that money. Maybe it is going to support staff. It might be going to back a house. But I would argue that I don't think that money is for anything but the front of house. Um, because right now it tips stick, stay with the front of the house. Um, and then from there, they're just picking an hourly wage. So I think if you started a restaurant and you're brand new, you get $17 an hour. And now there's, there's growth, but that's, is that, is that good? If, if, if I went to that model, I would probably have to try to find the average and start paying every, everyone in the restaurant $23 an hour. And then hopefully have a little up, say, okay, you've worked for me for a year, I can give you another dollar an hour, but they're not gonna be making $40 an hour like they are now, they're not gonna be making $35 an hour like they are now. There's no way that I could afford to do that, and you go into slow season, and just like we don't ever see that we still owe money to get them to minimum wage, remember these are averages, so there are times of the year that they're probably making $60 an hour, and sometimes they're making maybe 10, but I doubt it, 15 for me, just because I know that we're never having to get to any kind of position to add money into the, the labor. So Mark, what if we, as in Europe, I mean Europe, most, most restaurants in Europe charge a gratuity. It's not a service charge, it's a gratuity tip. And it is embedded in every bill, right there at 20%. Um, what if we required a gratuity on the rest But of on top of what wage? Now, if in, well, that's a, that, that's a question. One option, if one kept the tip minimum wage but required a gratuity, you get, you get away from having to please customers. I mean, you know, you get it automatically. I mean, and I think we need to hear from the Vermont Network and some other places to, to, to quantify the sexual harassment piece in Vermont, but from everything I understand, that it's a significant issue in Vermont. But if, if, if we could chip away at that piece by requiring a gratuity to be embedded in every bill, that would be, you know, on top of the current. I think, I think you could certainly try to do something like that. I think when a customer sees the word gratuity, they have an expectation that they have control over that um, versus service charge. I think uh, when you auto grant, we call it auto granting, but if you have a large table and we say we're gonna, we, a yeah, tip so many restaurants do that over six 
people. It doesn't mean that they don't go back and, and sometimes change that number, which we have, you know, have certainly have to make the decision on whether or not what we do with that, but typically we would unfortunately allow them to do that because that is a house rule we've made. It's not law. And they're saying they want to give less tip. Cheap skates. Right. God, you're but, kidding. But um, like, if you were to use the word gratuity and try to do an automatic gratuity, I think what my argument later, or I, and I understand I don't have a lot of time, is that we have to be competitive too. And we have states around us that wouldn't be making these same decisions at the same time. And I'm already getting reviews in Snow that use a dollar symbol for the S. And I have people from New York complaining about prices on my menu. And a lot of it has to do with the shortage of labor and what's happening in the back of the house. Um, and now we're talking about increased costs in my front of house labor. If in the one wage model, a significant increase, which would cause me to have to raise prices just for that, probably I would estimate 10 to 15% just to adjust for a one wage model. I mean, well, I'm, and I'm already, I'm already in trouble with tourists in terms of pricing and I would just fear yeah, that although with, that from New York you take it with a bit of a grain of salt when they're telling me that they can get things cheaper in in Manhattan than they can in Stowe that concerns me that that is a lie I don't think that's, <laughs> I, I don't As think a so. New Yorker, that is I just think like uh, you might be surprised where I mean I know um, you're looking at minimum wage but we're starting line cooks at 15 to 18 dollars an hour I, I I don't know in New York what they're paying for cooks and I think the other thing that's happening is there's a, a lot, and I've testified on this before, there's a lot of restaurants going to counter service models, even somewhat into fine dining. And what, when that's happening, they're removing that labor cost completely. You go into airports now, and that, there's all iPads all over the little food places, and that's how you order your food. They've eliminated that job. Yeah. And that happens when, I believe, that these jobs become more expensive to an employer, and they're figuring out how to, how to be a pro more profitable, and and my concern is that these jobs wouldn't exist in Vermont in the future. I've heard a restaurant owner that is very similar in size and Stowe talk about maybe going to iPads in their front of house. That scares me. Um, so yeah, I'll uh, I'll finish this and I can answer some more questions. Um, I've heard the argument of why does a customer have to pay wages, which um, any other business. It's just built into price. If you go and you, you go buy a product, you go to a store, they figured out what that price is to include the labor. In a restaurant model, they don't. We certainly could do it, but again, I think I'd, I'd probably make more money and my servers would make less. Um, I think um, there's comments about um, restaurant growth, and I believe that restaurants are growing. I think there's a younger generation that um, values experience and quality. I think it's a lot of what Vermont has seen in gross, growth in the restaurant industry is that this focus on experiencing what Vermont has to offer and getting tourists up here and then showing them that we can do it, uh, serve them very high quality ingredients, a lot of which that are from Vermont, is a trend. Um, with that, you're gonna see increased prices, you're gonna see increased growth if you're just looking at sales dollars. And then any, any market that has to absorb increased costs into price, you're gonna see sales growth because the number has to go up. A restaurant doesn't report tips in its P&L, but that would basically put tips back into the P&L, which would show a higher gross, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're any healthier than they were the previous year. So I think that's a really important thing is it's presented as these, these states that have made these changes, you're seeing growth, well some of it's forced into it because that that additional labor cost had to be made up in price or a service charge that would now hit that restaurant's P&L. Um, and, and then I, I would ask you to look at Maine. I don't know if uh, anyone's heard that Maine did actually go to a one wage model and it, the service and bartenders actually lobbied and got that reversed because they started to see decreased tipping and they believe that that's the wrong thing to do too. And that was, was in the article uh, yeah, about, I, um, about Maine. I added the article. I don't need to be saved. Mm -hmm. I'll be damned. Mark, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So, class comes into play here in terms of you know, what, what restaurants we're talking about, which servers. Sure. You know? sure. And so, would your, um, would your suggestion be that folks who are 
waiting tables at these chains who are not coming up to minimum wage per shift? Is it, is, would your argument be it's enforcement? That yeah. those, those yeah. employers are yeah. not doing already? I would argue that we should push for higher minimum wage to a livable wage as quickly as possible and follow it up with heavy enforcement and making sure that um, right now, if my employees look at a pay stub, I think it's relatively clear that they're making minimum wage, but it's, it doesn't say the number per hour you were paid for that role. And, it, and similar to a concern, your concern about just, um, I think just like a lot of employers don't want to come and make the testimony on today, of fear that that would put their business at risk. I agree that um, there's always the question of how can, how can in any, Anytime anyone thinks they're wrong, and, they, and they, can they call a, a number and be anonymous and say, right. you know, X Y Z for whatever crime? It's a crime. Right. That's a crime. Right. So that should, there should be an easy way that Vermont forces employees to know their rights. And it, I don't force, but basically know their rights, know who to contact, right. and report your employer. I love it. I I I love it. It's all a level playing field, right. or a fair playing field. Right. And then if you have a minimum wage of $15 an hour and employers aren't getting their employees at $15 an hour very clearly on paper, they should be reported, right? Like, that's how it should work. So if you weren't, I mean, there are several directions we could go with tipped employee, employees here, but if you were not facing the prospect of one, I hope you'll be honest with this, one wage or an escalator on the tip wage. Would you be in here opposing increasing the minimum wage for your no. back of the house people? No. We're already there. Yeah, the market. The market's, market's already there. driven it there. I believe that we are, Vermont is a very expensive state to live and we are already struggling to keep employees in the state because they are struggling to find Housing. Affordable housing is a great example, right? right? Vacancy. Snow has a zero vacancy rate. Yeah, right. So we already know in order to just retain, we have to be up there. I don't think that's healthy, and there's plenty of discussions on how to try to address that. But I, I'm, I wouldn't be fighting that because I don't like the discrepancy. These wages, compared to what I'm paying in the back of the house, are significantly higher. And what will happen is... Even if the model doesn't change as it currently is, I still think decoupling is the correct way to go so you're not giving raises to these employees because A, they're not asking for it, and B, that money could, could be going to the back of the house without me making a, an extra dollar. That, that, just, that increase to that cost of the back of the house and my cost of goods, I'll most likely take in price, and then these servers will see an increase in income because tips are a percentage of price. So when I have to absorb the brewery, some of those breweries are buying local ingredients, the distributor, and then I buy that beer from them and I have my markup and every one of them has a profit that they're, they're trying to retain to stay open, I'm gonna have to take price or I'll eventually be out of business because my, my costs are gonna increase labor and cost of goods will increase beyond well, what I can afford. One of the things I heard was there was concern about the elimination of the 20 rule at the federal level. But I'm also getting the sense that that rule is kind of meaningless. And he has said, we could put a state law, like I, if 820 and reinstate with the federals have repealed, but I'm not sure that's going to help much. Sure. But I also question if it's, I, I don't know, there's probably other ways you could, if, if the, the real concern is that people are doing tip, they're getting paid a tipped wage, but not doing a tip job, I think there's other ways that you could create compliance behind that and through law. I know, I know we need to move on, but um, just we are economic development housing and general affairs. Oh, you are. Housing, and yes, it's yeah, housing. So oh, housing yeah. is a huge right issue now. for us, I was and we're going to be doing a fairly substantial housing bill this year. Bring me, bring me back for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we would love that. We so hear much. this from our restaurateurs in Broward Road, too. Right. I mean, we so just there now. We want to know, yeah. how far on average are your employees driving to work for you? Um, Where are they living? 
And Water Bay restaurant anywhere from Burlington to Barrie to Morrisville? So long hikes, most of them. Um, in Waterbury, some of them can live locally. Stowe, very rarely do they yeah. live in Stowe, and, and that's unfortunate. Um, I think it's a mixture of, um, I don't think some of the, the numbers are accurate. I, I see these vacancy rates that say 3%, and I was presented with data that showed a zero. So I, I think, um, whatever it is, it's not a healthy base. It's not healthy. It's not, it's not, it's it's not, not healthy. And yeah. what's, what's happening yeah. is I think that there's a, there's a nomadic, as soon as you're talking about employees that rent, they're, they're much easier uh, no, to be nomads. They're, they're looking out west at all the other towns that are also doing very similar things that are maybe figured out how to do, how to do public transportation better. So all of a sudden they don't need a car. Right. Vermont, it's very expensive to have a car. Costs are, we're, we're, we're slightly more expensive on a lot of things, I'm sure you know. Um, and I think that there's a uh, anti-development sentiment that has created uh, a vacancy rate that's unhealthy and unsustainable. And, 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 and you said some of your employees own their own homes. Yes, yeah. So do they tend to own them in the communities they're serving? Close, I mean, uh, Stowe, Morrisville, Waterbury. Um, Waterbury, Duxbury, Baston. No, not not huge. Not so far Bolton. Right, Bolton. So, so the people that own their homes are not commuting as far. Is it uh, fair? No, it could be the same. I think well, a lot of I don't know any of them that live in Burlington. I don't think own. So yeah, I guess you could say. Yeah, that. my guess it's is a little you tighter. Could, if you did a study yeah. of it, you'd find that yeah. that would probably be the case. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, but yeah, with with housing. I, I, I think that I, I'm a select boardsman in Waterbury. Mm -hmm. So if we can't grow at inflation on the grand list, that's, that's potentially increased taxes too. And I know we have a vacancy problem. Why not try to figure out how to do smart growth, higher density in downtowns, a younger generation wants to be able to live and work in a downtown, right. not have a car. I mean, there's so many things. We're right that, there. Yeah. 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 No, and it's to remind us once again that Housing is really the nexus for so many of, of for the sure. issues that we're trying to deal with. And, and I don't know how you deal with the transportation thing. I think that the state really needs to look at it. The bus and stow only runs to 9:30, so an employee can get to work, but they can't get, get home, home. So they need a car. Yeah. You know, it doesn't. It's not 365 days a year. So right. they need a car because why would they not have one? This season, you know, it just doesn't right. it doesn't work. So it, and they threatened to cut the seasonal bus. Oh, I know. I was almost in that meeting the other day. Yeah, <laughs> feel free to help that transportation. How you feel? Um, Thank you for your. But yeah, um, can Thank I answer any other questions? I am. We know how to open, you. I'm an open book. I mean, I'm happy to to show you my real numbers, bring in other restaurant owners, and I, at some point, servers and bartenders too to come in and talk I, about. I think that is well noted. Yeah. And the Vermont Network, I think we have a couple. And what is the the actual tipped minimum wage now? Uh, it's five thirty-nine or something. I don't. The payroll company does. It's fifty percent of fifty. Last year was five twenty-five. Okay, so it's ten seventy-eight. Yeah, it's exactly. Okay. It's yeah. going to keep going right. up every year. Yeah, yeah. Right. So right. Even, if, even if the even if the governor doesn't sign any yeah. wage bill, yeah. we're still it's on track. track. And that's my argument against coupling: is that it's just automatically. It doesn't look like a lot, but over time, that coupling is a forced increase in cost to businesses that. I, don't, I think is unnecessary when we're already dealing with other increased costs and I don't think the employees are asking for it or necessarily need it because the rule that you have to get the minimum wage. These 20, these 20 to $40 an hour servers are not asking for a yearly small couple of wage, but it's a big number if you look at it on the scale of the business as a whole. Um, every dollar is $18,000 in increased costs. So last year, a quarter was four thousand dollars in increased cost. Thank you. Yep. Thanks a lot. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. We really appreciate. It. Uh, so next on the list we have Kate Logan. But Kate, I noticed we have a long list of witnesses, and Rights and Democracy testified on this last week. Is there no, some, I didn't. No, she didn't. Rights and Democracy. Oh, one of our, one one of your, uh, Jubilee McGill, a yeah. member who was a housing specialist in Addison County, she spoke provided on testimony. Okay. Cool. Uh, 
because I mean, I, the only reason I said that because I've cut down several people yeah. from the chamber want to testify, as oh. did restaurant owners, and I sent only one witness per group. Oh, yeah. So I've cut people off that want to testify. No, so I, I would have prepped her. I would have prepped her <laughs> to provide testimony. Yeah, I think that's what advocacy organization operating in Vermont, New Hampshire, um, and the Rights and Democracy Education Fund, a 501c3 organization whose mission is to research and advocate for policies that create communities in which everyone has the freedom to thrive. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to all of you today and for your efforts to find solutions to the issues of poverty and inequity facing our state. I'm testifying today on behalf of both Rights and Democracy and as a co-facilitator of the Raise the Wage Coalition, consisting of nearly 30 organizations, uh, groups focusing on women's rights, children's well-being, racial justice, hunger and homelessness, affordable housing, disabled Vermonters, low-income Vermonters, socially responsible business, and the majority of union members in our state who all share a common goal of raising the wages of Vermonters in order to provide wages that will allow working people to meet the basics to support their household budgets. We support S23 and its pathway to a $15 minimum wage by 2024, but we also to continue to support, as we did last spring in a memo sent to House members of the committees contemplating the issue, amending this bill so that it includes moving toward one minimum wage that covers tipped workers and high school students, as well as clear language to make appropriations for any state budget impacts of increasing the minimum wage and for the adjustments to child care financial assistance eligibility that were discussed by Deb Brighton last week. I'll discuss each of these issues in turn, but I first will focus on the argument in favor of implementing a higher minimum wage standard in Vermont. This argument, I think, is an answer to a set of complex questions that the legislature is facing. Uh, what should our wage floor be in Vermont and to whom should it apply? Is raising the minimum wage a good response to wage stagnation and growing income inequity? Uh, what should we do to promote sustainable economic growth in Vermont, which has a private employment sector overwhelmingly composed of small businesses? And finally, and implied in some of the testimony and discussion that we heard um, last week, um, is increasing the minimum wage both just and justifiable economically? Um, so raising the minimum wage is one key step the legislature can take to enact an economic policy that works for all Vermonters, not just our wealthiest and most well-connected. We believe that anyone working full-time should be able to pay for their basic needs. In other words, workers should be valued and offer basic dignity in their work. We also believe that taxpayers should not be expected to indirectly subsidize businesses that are paying their workers less than a basic needs budget. By this standard, Raising the minimum wage to $15 per hour in 2024 would meet the basic needs budget of a childless worker sharing a one bedroom apartment with another childless worker and a two parent household with two fully employed adults, according to oral testimony provided by Joyce Manchester in the previous legislative session. As such, S23, S23 outlines a minimum wage policy position that would establish the lowest possible minimum wage that we should allow in other words, we would argue that this is what justice demands. And as we've already heard, this will deliver economic progress to tens of thousands of Vermonters. A gradually phased in $15 minimum wage would deliver broad benefits for nearly one in three working Vermonters, raising their pay by an average of $2,000 a year and beginning to reverse decades of pay inequality. Of the nearly 50,000 workers who would receive raises with this legislation, 87% are over 20 years old, 56% are women, 59% work full time, and nearly one in five are parents. Um, and just to clarify, I think there was a question for the Department of Labor last week, um, which didn't get a good answer about where these statistics come from. Uh, they derive from detailed work and hour uh, data gathered on a quarterly basis by the Vermont Department of Labor in order to fill, fulfill their duty to administer and enforce our mandatory unemployment insurance program. Further, 
Um, raising the minimum wage for the lowest paid jobs will establish a wage floor that will be benefit all of those whose wages provide for their income. That is the vast majority of Vermonters. As we've heard, wages have stagnated for most Vermonters. This is, in fact, a global trend, and it is the result of economic policy decisions rather than mysterious market forces that are beyond our control. The wage share of our GDP per capita, the share of our GDP that goes towards wages and salaries, has declined to levels that we have not seen since the Great Depression. Meanwhile, corporate profits and unearned income have risen, receiving the largest share of the productivity gains and GDP growth over the last 40 years. And at the same time, the average individual the average individual effective tax rate has risen while the corporate tax rate has fallen. What we see are state, national, and global trends that have redistributed resources away from average workers and towards corporations, investors, and financiers. Similarly, the largest wage growth has been at the top end of the wage scale, and the most severe wage inequality can often be found within the same building or corporation. In other words, policy has built an economy that disproportionately benefits top income earners. Um, and this is encouraged by top income earners activism. Um, in fact, the example that um, Mark Fryer just gave of uh, the defeat of the tipped wage workers being brought into the minimum wage in Maine is an example of um, National Restaurant Association activism um, who paid uh, consulting company who had worked for the Trump campaign to come in and um, do a, uh, a, you know, run a campaign to recruit restaurant workers to lobby um, their own legislators on behalf of not including them in the full tipped minimum wage. Um, they did so under with false um, campaign narratives like save our tips. Um, where there was a rumor spread that you know bringing tipped workers into the minimum wage would uh, meant that they were going to actually eliminate tips. That hasn't happened in any of the seven states where the tipped workers have been brought into the full minimum wage, and um, there are plenty of data to share with you about the fact that average income for restaurant workers has gone up in all of those states. Um, there's just a ton of data around that issue. I'd be happy to provide more for you, and I'm sure um, Saru uh, would be as well. Um, so anyway, um, this is unjust, and justice demands that we do not make policy decisions that increasingly create divisions within our society between those to, who deserve to thrive and those who do not. Um, there's a long list of interventions that policymakers could take to curb those trends, and increasing the minimum wage is just one of those. Um, and would help to reverse a trend that suppresses average wages in favor of highly paid executives and unearned income for investors and financiers. Um, my own grandfather, the middle child in a family of 13 from rural Smith Center, Kansas, was able to support his wife and three children on the income that he received from working as a gas station attendant and the occasional odd job. Uh, perhaps he did not have the fire in the belly, as Commissioner Curley put it last week, to pursue higher skilled and higher paying employment, but he was also a beloved member of his family and community and fully employed in a job that was essential to the local economy. He had dignity in his work and in his community. Last year, I surveyed and canvassed low-income Vermonters in Burlington, Colchester, Grand Isle, Rutland City, and St. Albans. When I spoke to folks who were not fully employed and who were not disabled and who were willing to talk openly with me about their experience, I routinely heard that they made the decision to work less than full time because it would enable them to receive public assistance that would give them more than if they worked full time at the jobs that were available to them. In other words, they made a reasonable financial decision to have a higher quality of life, more food, better housing, and so on by working less. These folks were universally ashamed to admit this, and not one of them um, was willing to publicly share their story. One way to interpret this is that these folks do not have the fire in their belly. Um, another way to interpret this is that our current wage policy incentivizes underemployment and undervalues the labor of everyday working people, and that these folks are making choices to have the highest possible quality of life within the circumstances that they find themselves. 
We've degraded the dignity of work and working people in our communities by allowing employers to pay wages that do not offer self-sufficiency to adults who are working jobs that need to be done. While the American economy has grown and per capita GDP has increased, everyday American workers now experience a lower quality of life than my grandfather did in rural Kansas in the 1950s. We can begin to address this by raising the wage floor. But we must also ask how and whether increasing wages promotes economic stability and growth, both in general and in Vermont. In other words, is raising the minimum wage both just and justifiable in basic economic terms? So I'll offer only one of the many, many economic arguments in favor of increasing the minimum wage. Here it would be helpful to look at Australia, where a livable wage policy has been in place since 1907. In 2017, Australia celebrated its 25th year without suffering a recession. Aside from maintaining strong exports, this is also attributed to Australia's wage policy. Um, note adjusting for the purchasing power, for purchasing power, S23 would bring Vermont in line with the Australian minimum wage. What does that mean? I was reading that. Um, you would, because they earn uh, Australian dollars and we earn American dollars on the global market. So just adjusting. Yeah, basically how much an Australian dollar can um, buy here. compared to so, an American so dollar. Are you, are you just saying that if we pass this bill, our minimum wage will be comparable to Australia? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, in yeah. 2024. Yeah. Okay. I think it's like 18 something in Australian dollars right now. Right. Um, which is like which is less, like, oh, less than US dollars. Yeah, which is a comparable to $13. American. But by 24, they would be similar. Yeah. Comparable. Yeah, they'd be comparable. Um, another good way to like get a good base wage is to allow national, you know, bargaining at, at the industry level, uh, which is what Scandinavian countries do instead of having a minimum wage policy. But we don't do that in the United States either. The explanation um, for this effect is that economic recessions are related to declines in consumption. A higher wage floor helps to break the positive feedback loop that causes economic recessions because those who earn the least are often the least directly impacted by ebbs and flows or crises in the stock market. But differently, those with the lowest incomes spend the majority of their income on consumer goods. Um, even when the stock market fluctuates, the average worker will continue to purchase goods at roughly the same rate that they usually do, even while investors su suffer losses in their stock, pol stock portfolios, that is their unearned income. With no significant decline in consumption, there's no need to lay off workers, which would cause a further decline in production, consumption, and further layoffs. Uh, so in other words, everyday workers are the bedrock of Vermont's economic stability and potential for sustainable economic growth. When we improve workers' ability to purchase their basic needs, we provide the freedom for our entire economy to thrive. In Vermont, where the large majority of our private sector is comprised of small businesses, increasing the wage floor will have a positive impact on our state's economic growth and will give workers the spending power they need in order to buy more from local businesses and service providers. We could probably incentivize that in other ways as well. Um, <clears throat> but we need not only consider the question as to whether or not to raise the minimum wage in Vermont, but also who the minimum <laughs> wage should cover. Um, we would argue that S23 should be amended to bring both tipped workers and high school students into the full minimum wage. Briefly, including tipped workers and high school students in the full minimum wage is both just and economically justifiable policy decisions. As discussed in uh, Saru's testimony this morning, bringing tipped workers into the full minimum wage would mitigate this policy's historical origins as a form of institutional racism and sexism, as well as its current contribution to high rates of harassment for workers in the hospitality industry. Tipped wage public policy had its advent in the United States as a means to exclude black workers, particularly black women, from participation in the minimum wage standard that was established in the New Deal. Further, the subminimum wage for tip workers continues to place these workers in a morally compromised position where they are virtually forced to tolerate harassment in order to secure tips from their patrons. I can speak personally of that. I think every woman in the room who's worked in the service industry can attest to that. If you were to take further testimony on this issue and considering an amendment to S23, you'll also learn that bringing tipped workers into the full minimum wage 
does not have adverse economic impacts based on the seven and increasing number of states that have done so. Further, and expert testimony to this issue could be provided by Yana Lothrop at the National Employment Law Project. Bringing high school students into the full minimum wage is also necessary in order to avoid disproportionately negative impacts on high school students from low income families, but it has broader impacts on all workers. High school students from low income families will not only face, incent uh, face increased incentive to drop out of school before graduation so that they can better contribute to their family's budgets, but lower wages will also impact their ability to save for their lives after high school. Additionally, these students work side by side alongside adult workers in the same industry. Um, a subminimum wage for high school workers incentivizes employers to adopt a high turnover staffing model in place of adults in order to cut costs. Both tipped workers and high school students should be included in the full minimum wage, and we urge you to take further testimony on these issues and to amend S23 to fully include these workers in the wage. Additionally, we would further ask that the committee amend S23 to address one phrase in section two, quote, to the extent that funds are appropriated, unquote. As Deb Brighton testified last week, um, expanding eligibility for the CCFAP uh, to hold harmless working parents who receive pay raises as a result of raising the minimum wage is essential to ensuring that this policy change does not harm some of our most vulnerable low-wage workers, parents, um, and, and the children of those parents. In addition, this section of the bill includes appropriations for all other public uh, budget lines that would be impacted by increasing the minimum wage due to increased wages for some state employees and contractors who provide essential services that are publicly funded, such as home health care aides. Uh, the appropriations language in S23 should reflect the necessity to make appropriations rather than setting out recommendations for how to allocate funds in case they are appropriated. And um, finally, just an additional note uh, uh, in response also to Mark Fryer's testimony regarding boosting enforcement capacity. Um, if we were to add or you know, continue to have a sub-minimum wage for tipped workers, Currently, the state has, I think, two field staff at the Department of Labor in the Wage and Unemployment Unit. Um, that covers all places that pay wages and pays um, unemployment insurance or pays into unemployment insurance. Uh, that uh, those staff are largely funded by federal dollars um, in order to administer the unemployment insurance program. And so, this, if we're, I mean. We have some ideas about how to boost enforcement in the state um, through um, empowering workers to take public action on behalf of the state. Um, but I think the kind of enforcement, especially with the sort of data that we had from the Obama administration regard regarding the lack of worker awareness of the law, uh, coupled with the lack of compliance with the law, I think suggests that you'd have to, yeah, I don't know, well, 84 percent lack of compliance. 84 high. Sort of right, and so we don't, and we don't have good data on the lack of compliance in Vermont. Um, we're trying to address that through a study that is chaired by a professor from Middlebury College right now, which we hope to have by next month. Um, but partially, the reason that we don't have the data that we want is because we have two people to enforce data reporting from you know, people who pay wages um, into the unemployment insurance program. And, um, you know, there are all these data points that they want uh, employers to provide, including how many hours folks have worked, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, but they can't enforce it. And they don't really have the capacity to even clean the data um, when somebody types the wrong number into the system and, and things like that. Um, and not, not every small employer uses a payroll service, so um, relies heavily on their own data, too. So um, I'm, I'm just a little nervous about expanding enforcement capacity to continue to make sure that people are making the kind of money they're supposed to be making. Um, well, just to clarify, you're not saying we shouldn't expand enforcement capacity. Yeah. You're just saying you don't have faith in the capacity we have now. I don't, and I, and I don't have faith in, you know, the state's willingness to boost enforcement capacity in this one particular area. Well, and further, um, you know, elimination of the tip minimum wage 
makes this a non-issue. There's no longer any question about whether somebody, you know, a tip, a worker is getting a minimum wage. They're just paid the same way everybody else is. It just eliminates administration. Right. Of it. But also, if they're, you know, with the DOL money and if it's federal money, it's primarily for UI. Mm -hmm. And if it's federal, it means they wouldn't be able to go and enforce tip minimum wage issues because yeah. now, uh, because of Trump's rule rescinded. Mm -hmm. So we'd have to fund all of the enforcement ourselves um, or find other creative ways to boost enforcement. But it just seems like probably eliminating like a very complicated reporting um, requirement in the tipped wage, additionally rectifying the historical wrongdoing is probably the better idea. So we're grateful um, for your leadership on this issue. Uh, Despite S-40 being vetoed in the last year's session, uh, we thank you for taking our testimony today. Um, please join with working people, supportive business owners, and your constituents and raise the wage for nearly a third of our workforce and help us make the Green Mountain State a leader for working families in the middle class. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have uh, David McKinberg. Nice to see you, David. Nice to see you. How are you? I know, first time this there was, a, there was a mistake on your agenda. I'm not here on behalf of the Vermont Association for Justice. Trial lawyers are getting the majority. Many of our clients are not. Um, no, I'm here for three clients. Uh, Working Vermont, uh, which is a coalition of many of the public and private sector unions in the state of Vermont. Uh, AARP Vermont and Co the Coalition of Vermont. Uh, the coach of Vermont, uh, community of Vermont elders. Sorry, lots of clients. Um, I will oh, like so co working Vermonters, working Vermonters, co and AARP. AARP Vermont, yeah. Um, and I'm going to read in the, the Cove and the AARP statements are brief. They're, I've sent them to the committee and you have copies too. So, uh, just a few points, and I will be brief um, on from a, the working Vermont. Working Vermont perspective, um, we think this debate is a lot like the debate we had around um, Vermont's prevailing wage as it pertains to construction contracts. That when you set a standard, which is a livable standard, uh, we see increases in productivity and efficiency. And you've heard from economists, I'm certainly not an economist, uh, but you've seen the benefit of that. Um, reflected in the numbers that you've received. We, we saw the same thing in the debate over prevailing wage. I know Senator Ballant, one of the first issues she worked on, exciting issue. Um, but the state of Vermont has recognized that for construction workers, that there's a, there's a, a minimum that is appropriate. And uh, we saw it fit to increase that uh, by 42.5% uh, a few years ago uh, to acknowledge for the appropriateness of having benefits included in what wages are paid to construction workers in the state of Vermont. Um, another issue, we, I've heard some testimony about, well, how are we going to pay for this as, as small businesses? Um, one thing I just wanted to point out is that we saw in the last few years one of the largest um, redistributions of wealth uh, in our country's history through the tax, uh, to, through the tax bill that was passed on a federal level. So what we saw there was um, pass-through entities like LLCs and other pass-through entities getting 20% reductions in their taxes. Um, we saw the lowering of the corporate rate to 21%. We saw significant lowering of individual tax brackets. So um, we did not see commensurate increases in things like um, the earned income tax credit or the federal minimum wage, frankly. So the money is there. It was created very much by, um, by this tax cut. And we think that it's appropriate that if you're going to give uh, the wealthiest uh, companies and individuals a massive tax break, that some of that money should flow uh, to, um, to the workers that are helping them uh, create the wealth. So. Uh, and a final point uh, on a point of competition, we see this particularly in the construction uh, unions in Vermont that we are paying the, the unionized construction 
uh, workers are being paid a, a fair uh, middle income wage and they have a very difficult time competing with those businesses which are uh, undercutting, uh, cutting corners. I appreciate, just as a, as a side, I appreciate the last two witnesses talking about enforcement and I hope that we can come back here later uh, in this session and talk about enforcement and the need to enforce uh, our laws, whether it's wage and hour laws or laws, laws around misclassification because what a lack of enforcement does um, is really uh, drives businesses to those that are cutting corners at a competitive disadvantage for those that are doing the right thing. So I would say in this minimum wage bill, it's very similar. There are a lot of Vermont businesses that are paying this and they are now at a competitive disadvantage to those that are not oftentimes multinational corporations that are here. So um, that's all I have with my working Vermont hat on. I'm just gonna read these two short statements into the record from ARP Vermont. And I should just say I'm working Vermont. I don't know if I said it, we fully support S23 and, and look forward to working with you to help get it passed. Um, ARP Vermont, this is a statement from Greg Marshall, then our executive director. Uh, well, this is not an area, sorry. Say one thing about working Vermont, because I, I had some personal experience with that as well, which I won't get into, but is it, in your mind, is there any single worker within working uh, I actually think there are a few. Um, there are some construction workers uh, that are sort of, uh, are you talking about $15 or less than $15? Well, actually, the current, the current, the current minimum seven. wage. I, I don't think, there may be, you know, I don't want to say definitively, but by and large, no. I think um, most of the unionized workforce gets above 1050 or 1075 an hour at this point uh, in Vermont. There may be some pockets in certain unions that represent really low low wage workers, maybe ask me, um, you know, and others. But by and large, um, and I should just say, as as labor unions who, by and large, our, our members would not benefit from this bill, we still think it's absolutely essential. I mean, we are part of uh, a movement um, for workers um, to, to generally have better conditions. The labor movement has oftentimes advocated for uh, positions that rise everyone's uh, you know, up as opposed to just their own interests. And in many ways, that's the point of working Vermont is to advocate on issues that help workers generally, not just uh, unionized workforce. So. You mentioned cutting corners, uh, that there are those businesses that are cutting corners that are contrary to the members of working Vermont. Can you elaborate a little bit of what you mean by that? Sure. I mean, the issue of the misclassification of, of, of employees as independent contractors is a huge one. You can save somewhat, you know, upwards of 30% on your margins if you misclassify somebody as an independent contractor. You know, that's an issue that's been rampant in the, in the restaurant industry and other places, construction, uh, janitorial services, but throughout Vermont's economy, uh, the use of, of illegal and inappropriate misclassification is a way to, uh, I would say, bolster the margins for owners to the detriment of workers and also to the detriment of companies that are paying those fair wages. And so we, we, well, we get a report any day now that we asked for last year on the scope of the enforcement of that. Uh, we heard, I don't know if you're here, but we heard a brief report from Damien. And the numbers were kind of what to fear. Yeah. Hi. So, okay. Um, okay. I'll just move on to ARP and then go quickly. Um, so ARP statement, while this is not an area that ARP Vermont has been engaged in to any great extent, ARP does support legislative efforts such as S23, which would help workers make progress to obtaining sufficient income to cover essential living expenses. Furthermore, we would, be support, we would, we would support indexing such laws to ensure that they keep up with inflation so that workers can meet their ongoing basic needs. I know the indexing was a piece that you talked about last year. Um, I don't know where you're headed with it on this. Do you, but. Do you um, can you get us any kind of job data on like, people, 
most focused on people over 65 who may be taking part-time jobs to make ends meet that might be lower than $15. Because I feel like there are seniors you see maybe bagging groceries yeah. or something like that. If you nationally or locally, because uh, yep. yeah. some, some people would say that this bill doesn't affect seniors at all. Oh. So we know, certainly <laughs> anecdotal, we, we, got, we have uh, Ruby Baker from Cove, who's the executive director of Cove, um, requested information from the Department of Labor, and we got some information showing how many people over, at what age groups are, um, are in the workforce. They, they couldn't tell us whether they were making minimum wage or not, which was surprising to me, but um, their economists said they didn't have that. Well, if you could put some questions on me, or maybe or yep. he has the resources to find yep. that out. Yep. Uh, so, one of, I'm sort of disappointed that this testimony doesn't actually address the, the huge population that would be affected is women. Because uh, the, we know the vast majority of older people are women, uh, and uh, we know that when they earn less, they live on less as they age. So, that is a huge piece for, for I think, a number of us uh, uh, with. Uh, as, as we look at these two communities. So I'm sort of surprised it's really not addressed in either COVE or AARP's um, memos. And uh, I think there's a lot of data on that. Um, and uh, if you look at Change the Story, the, the wonderful work that uh, was done by that commission on women, you can see that, that data. Okay. So that is a, another major reason, particularly for the, the older community, both a, their earnings so little with their pension and social security, many are driven back into the workforce, and there are many of them retiring on so much less, they're earning less as they age. So, yeah. big big issue for women. Yeah, I mean, right now, the, thank you, Ruby, the, the data from the Department of Labor says that women age um, 55 to 64, there's 33,400 in the workforce, and 65 plus 15,400 in the workforce. Uh, a little bit more for men over 65, and a little bit less for men between 55 and 64. So. Yeah, but no idea what their wage they, they, The Department of Labor apparently can't, doesn't track that. So We need to ask them. To, I mean, a lot of this is just us embedding, asking for measures in our bills, which we have to remember to do all the time, or we can have almost no government accountability. Okay. You, you, want me to, you, you have this. We have it. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you. Nice to see you. I should just say for the record that both ARB and CO support S23 right. and encourage its passage. And we're grateful for this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Austin Davis. Did you want to take yeah. a break, Mr. Chair? No, I'm going to go, go, try and go right through and I'll take a break here before we hear from He is going to turn us all into camels. Gotcha. <laughs> But I would appreciate this brevity. I didn't see a graphic request on the camel. The camel bill. Legislators as camels. It made the camera. <laughs> All right. Well, for the record, Austin Davis, Government Affairs Manager at the Lake Champlain Regional Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, members of the esteemed Senate Committee on Economic. Economic Housing and General Affairs for um, inviting us to speak last week and making time for us this week. Um, and we would like to to start off by saying um, we see that the Vermont economy is currently experiencing a labor shortage with an unemployment rate at 2.8%, um, and in the Burlington area, uh, an unemployment rate, which is in the near and dear to us, uh, employment rate of 2.1 percent and as our governor noted last week um, our state has about 15,000 fewer workers than in 2009. Additionally uh, our state statute is already increasing our state minimum wage by for the consumer price index annually or the lesser of the consumer price index annually or five percent and um, from our perspective these factors are already driving competition among employer employers in our area and resulting in upward pressure on wages within the Lake Champlain region specifically. Um, and this might not necessarily be the case in all counties and areas of Vermont. Um, however, it is in the Lake Champlain region. For these reasons, uh, LCRCC doesn't uh, oppose an increase in Vermont's minimum wage. 
We would, however, ask this committee to, um, and subsequently the General Assembly as they look at this bill, to direct you know, special consideration and attention um, to different proposals and factors that we would like to outline today. Um, we would ask that you consider adjusting the rate schedule in this bill S23 to more closely align with the rate schedule in last year's bill S40. Um, and I'll go into that in these, all these in a little bit uh, more detail. We'd also ask that you decouple the tipped and non-tipped minimum wage to create a higher marginal benefit for back of the house service and employees. Um, we'd like to also ensure that Vermonters dependent on state benefits are held harmless when making new income, which is something we've greatly, we've appreciated greatly seeing the intention that you folks have been putting towards that in the past weeks. Um, also, we'd ask with the passage of this bill, uh, efforts be refocused and redoubled away from the in side, income side of the equation and more towards the expenditure side of the equation that we see is really most affecting Vermonters um, on a day-to-day -day basis. I'd also like to take just one quick side note as a kind of... Uh, just before you get yeah. to that, you're basically saying on yeah. affordability debate, let's keep focusing on expenses and not on income. Yeah, this is kind of the brief overview of my testament. I'll dive into all these factors okay. earlier on, but yes, we're very concerned about affordability. Uh, Vermonters on a day-to-day -day basis have to balance their income and their expenditures. Uh, we feel that this legislature has focused on income a lot. Um, I believe last year, last week, it was actually discussed that this would be the fifth time that this body has taken up the minimum wage in the last two decades. Um, we're doing a lot to uh, increase Vermonters' income. We want to do just as much to reduce Vermonters' expenditures. And I've got some ideas that I'd like to, or some people to point you to, to discuss those things with that I think would be really beneficial to everybody in the conversation. Um, so right before I jump into it also, I'd like to just kind of make one overarching point. Uh, we've heard a lot of testimony today about, um, you know, uh, comparisons of apples to oranges of, well, uh, this is happening in this state or this is happening in another country or um, discussion about uh, extreme wealth disparity that might not necessarily fit in the context of Vermont, and also discussion about large corporations. Um, you know, I'd like to, uh, just, you know, as I head in my testimony, I'm speaking on behalf of Vermont. Um, in this state, we are predominantly very small businesses, um, you know, up to 84% below 25 employees, if I remember correctly. I come from a family that has a very small business, and all of the proposals we talk here about, um, I feel often are put in the context of this will affect Walmart, whereas Walmart can absorb necessarily, uh, uh, or this might affect insert big employer. They can absorb that, but the small businesses have the tightest margins and will be disproportionately impacted by any changes we make in this room. Um, so, uh, as a point of observation, also, um, you know, I have just a couple things I'd like to talk about that I, I've heard in conjunction with the minimum wage discussion um, in this chamber and also in and around the state. Um, we'd like to talk about um, compensation of employees and just that, less of a wage uh, context and more of a compensation. And uh, we think it might be helpful to have this conversation in the context of a compensation floor. Um, and the reason why I say that is because uh, if we have an employee, who, or a uh, Vermonter is going out and seeking employment, to them looking at a position that might make $13 an hour with benefits versus a position that might make $14 or $15 an hour with no benefits, they're gonna take that compensation into account. And I think that when we necessarily legislate a minimum wage, we're not always considering the uh, other benefits that come along with wages. Um, so there's folks out there who might be paying under what some folks would consider a minimum wage. However, they're going a little bit further and offering health care, additional training, things like that. Um, so that's just one thing I'd like to bring up. And I think that, you know, it's important. Um, last week we heard from, uh, I believe it was Franklin County Rehab Center, where they discussed, for example, training. That's a very important thing. She actually, if I remember correctly, testified that they spend up to 30 thousand uh, dollars on getting folks licensed as nurse practitioners and that to some extent is uh, a type of compensation um, that 
frankly, uh, we, we kind of expect that that comes out of our, our public education system. But it's a lot of times employers are taking on people at a minimum wage, um, training them up, understanding that they might not be contributing to the overall uh, entity or, or company or business um, for the, maybe the first six months. They'll train them, they'll move them up the rate scale very rather quickly. So that's one thing I just kind of wanted to flag. Um, also, I've heard a lot about minimum wage in relation to rent. Um, earlier, we heard, you know, we've all kind of talked about um, how, you know, housing is really at the nexus of a lot of problems. Um, I do think that there's a lot of comparisons made, um, specifically hearing, uh, you know, minimum wage hasn't kept up with the cost of housing. Well, housing stock hasn't kept up with demand in this state, and I, I just wanted to kind of um, we know Austin. Yeah. We know. I, I know. And I, <laughs> I, to I, I understand. And I, I'm extending an offer as the Lake Champlain Regional Chamber of Commerce do. We would love to work with you on housing issues because, as I said earlier, we see that as a large expenditure for most Vermonters, which is um, you know, the other side of the equation after we talk about income. Um, so, and then, um, yeah, so. To get into what I was discussing earlier about a slightly less aggressive rate schedule, I think last week it was uh, discussed that it was about a 6.1% average increase um, in wages, which is being proposed in this bill, S23. <clears throat> I didn't actually get a chance to go back and look at what S40 was, but as you all know, uh, you're looking at the same target in a shorter amount of time, and that's a, a you know, creating a larger, more aggressive increase. We'd ask that you just kind of stick closer to that um, last year's scheduled increase, which might push you out to 2025 to hit that $15 an hour target. However, we feel that, you know, um, the business community to some extent is planning with tight margins to, you know, in good faith, reach those targets. And even just an additional one and a half percent of increase in that rate can have really big ripple effects across a small business's books. Um, so I'll just say what you expect me to say. Uh, <laughs> you're just playing your role, is that what you're saying? <laughs> oh, it's almost like I didn't have to submit the testimony. <laughs> we agree with you as to the pace and we would have been there had not been for the veto. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And I, I understand yes. that and um, you know it's a new year, it's new parties who have come to the table. And we're all wanting. Same party. Uh, no. I was going to say yeah. same party. Different attitudes. All right, that's fair. Um, I'll concede that point. But I do think that you know you're still asking business communities to um, take on this for a factor that they couldn't have influence on. They couldn't have influence. It wasn't the business community that uh, vetoed the, the legislation. It would be the business community that would uh, feel the consequences of. Uh, more aggressive increase in a quicker time that will have more strain. So I just want to say on the comments you made about added benefits that go into what people pay, Senator Brock and others had an amendment on the floor last year to do that. We looked at that in, uh, in a summer study committee. No state except one city has ever gone into that level of detail surrounding uh, a minimum wage proposal. It can become very complicated very quickly administratively and I would bet my last dollar that if we went down that road the next argument is that we can't do this administratively, it's not worth the cost and, uh, and, and the bill would sort of unravel. So I appreciate the equity thing but there's also a practicality and we face practicality issues all the time. You should have been here last year when we tried to do paid leave and the Department of Labor said it would cost ten million dollars right. to administer the program. <laughs> That's so. right. Yeah, it's a little absurd. <laughs> so awesome, thank you for your testimony. I think affordability has two sides and sadly you cannot ignore the income if you're only looking at expenses. That's an absurdity. Uh, the second question we've heard for the last two years consistently that Vermonters the Vermont business underpays employees 20% national average. That, un that Vermont underpays consistently in every field. I know this personally for the Vermont Law School. Um, that when my husband was hired in 1991 to be a professor at Vermont Law School, paid 
average Vermont law school professor wage. Now it's 40% below um, national average. And that is what we've heard consistently, 20 to 40% below national averages. I'd like to ask you what you're gonna do on the employer side and on the small business side to bring wages um, up to, uh, to, to even it's not minimal average. wage. I mean, I think that is a huge issue on the affordability front period, no matter what your wage is in Vermont. And we're trying to do it for the lowest wage people, but I think on average, that is a huge issue facing Vermonters and affordability. So I actually have that later in my testimony. Um, if I can continue, I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. Oh, sorry, um, I thought you were As that. far as the compensation. I'm just say you're making me a little nervous in how long your testimony is going to be. Just to be fair, because we're getting, we're starting to get to the point where we're going to have to bump people again. So anything you can do to. I will speed along as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, just to cover on the compensation floor a bit, wasn't that I was necessarily proposing that we look to make a compensation floor in statute in the state. I just think it's a helpful frame when discussing this. And frankly, it's a frame that employers and employees work through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I can quickly skip over my next portion of my testimony because you heard really great testimony earlier from Mark about decoupling the tipped and non-tipped minimum wage. I'd say that uh, he did a really good job uh, capturing the essence of what we would say, and frankly, as a person who operates multiple restaurants, can say it better than we could. Um, frankly, you know, we'd like to see uh, folks, if we saw the decoupling, we could see more compensation going to folks in the back of the house and lifting all boats. So uh, we ask you to consider decoupling. Uh, benefits cliff, we can skip over that a little bit, as that's being worked through, and we really would like you to know that we're an asset as those conversations continue. Um, and then as far as, you know, kind of to your point, Senator, about um, across all, you know, walks of Vermont life, compensation is a little bit lower, and issues around affordability in the state, we really would actually like to suggest that you invite to testify um, the United Way of Northwestern Vermont uh, and to talk about their Working Bridges program. Uh, I've done a lot of sit-downs with manufacturers in Chittenden County to better understand wages and the uh, issues of affordability. Manufacturers, on average, are, are the mass majority of them, I've really not found any that aren't necessarily, are paying above what you're looking to legislate as the minimum wage. However, they're facing all the same problems that are put at the foot of minimum wage. And um, one such problem is turnover, which you folks have had a significant amount of interest in in this committee. So we think it'd be really helpful for you to understand uh, a lot of the issues they're seeing that are affecting turnover in the state and how wages aren't exactly an indication of turnover. Um, it's a lot of other affordability crisis issues. Um, basically, Working Bridges is a program in which um, a navigator comes to, is contracted with an employer to come to that employer, have office hours, and pretty much uh, be there for employees who might have life issues, whether that be affordable housing, transportation, childcare, all of these affordability crisis issues that we really like to see focus on um, after the you know passage of this bill out of this committee. Um, they, they focus on these things, and as I said, they focus on these things with employees who are making above the wage that you'd like to legislate. Um, and we just think they'd be a really good asset to so, you. So that would be fine. We're not in the business of seeking people out. I'm sure you can find a way of getting him to contact us. I can do that, sir. We're probably going to have one more day or part of a day on testimony. Then we're going to start moving on to discussing the bill in the committee. So if you want to follow up on that, you should do so. Soon enough, Senator Brock has somebody he's interested in testify. I'll work with Senator Brock to find a day that's convenient for his witness, and we'll talk to your witness at the same time. That's it. So, as I said, um, well, I'll keep it short as requested. You know, we are here as an asset to kind of work with you to take on these harder problems outside of wages. Uh, we see wages as, as one portion of the equation that we really need to focus on, and in our area specifically, we've seen that wages, uh, even if you are achieving high wages, just by issue of vacancy rates or um, unavailability of childcare, long waiting lines for different services, um, you know, wages don't solve all these issues, and we'd really like to get to solve them. Thank you. We all like to get to solve.
testimony. I know you've heard from a lot of people and I tried to craft my testimony kind of focus in on things that maybe you hadn't heard or to draw attention to these three areas. Although after this last testimony, I'm not sure about what it was. But anyway, um, I did want to um, express our appreciation for you taking this on. Um, our, we're a member of the Raise the Wage Coalition, so obviously we support the overarching goals of S23 as introduced. Uh, we appreciate your commitment to improving the economic security of working Vermonters uh, at the low end of the wage scale, whose pay has been largely stagnant while the cost of living has increased around the state. And we know, as advocates for children, that every dollar that comes into families, especially low-income families, improves outcomes for those kids. Um, we have uh, increasingly been paying attention to the needs of young adults. As, as a brain science knowledge around adolescence expands, we know that young adults um, are a constituency that still needs our attention. And so I wanted to draw uh, your attention to how minimum wage might be impacting young adults. Um, so you've heard some testimony that the average minimum wage worker uh, earner in Vermont is 38 and female, and that 45% of minimum wage earners are 40 or older. It's also true that young adults are overrepresented in the minimum wage workforce. Nationally, 54.6% of minimum wage workers are aged 16 to 24, and most of, the, most of those are over age 20, so these are young adults. This coincides with the age group that experiences the highest rate of poverty, young adults 18 to 24. And as a state, we should be concerned with the well-being of young adults, many of whom are parents and not shy away from the need for new workforce participants to earn enough to meet their basic needs. Raising the minimum wage is a critical policy tool to achieve this. Um, and this, this uh, chart that I lifted from Data USA shows you the, the breakdown in the poverty uh, rate by age and gender. And you can see right in the middle there that, that tallest row is males 18 to 24, um, followed by uh, females 18 to 24. And then the next two age groups, it's females, uh, 25 to 34 and then uh, that are that are also having much higher poverty rates than the rest of the age and gender groups and so just sorry to our previous testimony look at the final bar on the yeah. right right exactly yeah. older women yeah, yeah. right so um, it's unbelievable yeah, yeah. that's why I was stunned they didn't even yes and I'm certainly uh, concerned about older women as well um, but when we think about our constituency, the young adults and then these folks are, you know, the average age of first uh, childbirth is about 26. Um, so you look at who's, <coughs> who's having children um, and what their poverty rate is, it's bad. And then if you look to the left of the chart, you can see the consequences of those, um, the children living in poverty. So uh, kind of related to this, but not quite, is another constituency that I think doesn't have a, a large voice in this conversation is students. Um, so we do object to the expansion of the student wage from summer employment to year round. Students from low income families are often making a significant contribution to family income. For um, There's a report that came out of Massachusetts that for low income families, students uh, income was making 17.7% of their family income. So it's, it's serious. Um, so in addition, we're concerned about uh, the secondary student exemption encouraging people to drop out of school. If you're talking about a $3 difference, you know, um, and you're barely staying in school as it is, that, that might be the thing that causes you to leave school prior to graduation, which as we know has an impact on your earnings and your well-being throughout your life. Um, finally, to this point, Vermont's lack of investment in higher education puts additional pressure on young people to save for and contribute to the high cost of college or vocational training. We ask the expansion of the student exemption from the minimum wage be removed from S23 and that the legislature commission a study on the impacts of this policy on low-income secondary school students and their families. And then the last piece I think has gotten a little more muddled. Um, it's, it's this component about paying attention to um, what has been colloquially referred to as the benefits cliff. Um, 
we're trying to kind of call it something like the net family resources to meet basic needs. Um, so we're obviously appreciative of the um, of the attention being paid to address the unintended consequences of raising the minimum wage on people's eligibility, particularly for CCFAP. Um, my concern is that that um, to the extent funds are appropriated language, which I understand is typical um, in that we can't bind future legislatures, but I'm looking at it from the perspective of um, another policy that we're very familiar with, which is reach up. So reach up has an intended impact to um, protect kids from, from deprivation, and it's not meeting that intended impact. It's, it's not meeting its statutory purpose because it has this similar language of to the funds, to the extent that funds are appropriated. So it feels like there needs to be some stronger language, and I don't know what it is. The thought, um, what we did with Reach Up last year was um, require that um, Senate uh, approach put in a, an additional uh, phrase into the um, what we call the Current Services Report. I think it's called the Unfunded Budget Pressures Report or whatever it is. So, so that if there is a time when um, those funds are not appropriated, it is clear. Like there's some accountability. So if you are um, choosing not to appropriate it, you will find out how much that the funds should have, you know, what the amount was that should have been appropriated, and it'll have a line in that report. So it just creates more transparency. I mean, obviously I'd like to hope that, um, that it wouldn't come to that, that this there's a commitment obviously to have those funds appropriated, but we know that in addition to the um, to the 1.5 million or whatever Jeff just mentioned, there are tremendous pressures on the child care, child care financial assistance program, uh, tens of millions of dollars. So we want to make sure that the um, the things aren't lost in a shuffle. Um, so, that so that's a I mean, that's a good point. I mean, I've been around this building long enough to know how things yeah. work. Um, last year, in in hallway conversations with the appropriations committee, they prefer that we not direct them how to spend the money. They, as you know, because the bill has to go there, they will make that decision one way or another. So the question is why aggravate them in advance? Yeah. Um, it may be different this year. With $7 million, we might want to say that this is, a, of, of any new funds appropriate, this needs to be the first priority that people don't go backwards. So we'll we'll look at it and see, but I you know I have to be honest. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that they're going to decide, and it's it's not. Uh, it's, at least last year, there were a lot of competing interests, and so to, to to be gentle and say we like this idea, we think this is important, but we understand that you're the appropriator is just prioritizing things. Um, please take a look at this. And it worked out. I know there was some glitch where the timing of the veto, where the language maybe didn't come right, but the intent of the leg legislature of both sides was to fund, to, to hold people harmless last year. So that strategy worked last year. So sometimes it doesn't sound like a like hardball, but you just send the wrong message. Yeah, but, I understand that. But our job also is to advocate, as we all know strongly, for the things we feel are really and um, we may have to be advocating for that money, actually, given where probes upstairs may end up. But, you know, who knows if the seven million as an aspirational aspect of the budget will actually be uh, uh, honored. And even within that seven million, we don't know where it will be. All that is true, but yeah. given the government for seven million dollars, they will have a fierce, not only need and advocacy around that, that's going to either stay or grow. I, think I find it hard to believe that if you get that kind of money, they're going to let people go in the wrong direction it as a result of uh, new money. I think it totally depends on what is cut in to make that $7 million. <coughs> yes. So quite honestly, I think that is the piece that I'm not fully appreciating is where the tit for tat on that is. Okay, so we'll, so we'll see what they come up with in language next week and we want to be more aggressive.
Well, and it's something that we'll continue to have. I mean, my, my experience of Senator Kitchell is that she's a big fan of transparency. She's the one who fought for that reach up language. You also mm -hmm. get it in there. So I, right. I feel like that, that's yeah. a conversation we'll pursue as well. No, it supports her yeah. interest and value. Exactly. Thank, Thank you, Michelle. Yes. And uh, stick around because we're going to have a little discussion on student wages with oh. Amy and after. Um, sure. I found him. It's all about food. So we did the debate Jump the other day. So he, yeah, Duncan Jones. Good morning. Hi, good morning. So hi, my name is Kara. And I work for the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence with a statewide federally recognized domestic and sexual violence coalition in Vermont. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today in support of S23. And um, I'll go over my testimony. I didn't specifically address the tip wage, but I uh, would be happy to um, give you my thoughts about that and answer any questions that you have about that. So uh, the Vermont Network supports legislation that would help to mitigate the impacts of poverty. Statistics show that people who live in poverty are twice as likely to experience sexual assault. And we know that domestic violence often, 99% um, of the time, includes some form of economic abuse. Economic effects of domestic and sexual violence are pervasive and long lasting. Just to give you an idea of some numbers, uh, recent studies estimated the lifetime costs of rape alone was over $122,000 per victim. And for intimate partner violence, it was over $100,000 per female victim and um, over $20,000 per male victim. And this includes the impacts to the survivor as well as the um, society as a whole. So this includes things like um, you know, court costs and um, civil criminal, Sorry, Kara, yeah. did you submit this electronically to Kara, uh, to Kayla? Uh, yes, this morning I did. And okay, I have great. The, no, no, I just, I just, I just, I cited listen the not take notes. at the bottom as well. Right. So, um, so um, <clears throat> uh, women, people of color, immigrants, people with disabilities, and L LGBTQ folks are um, most impacted as they already experience a wage gap. Raising the minimum wage will have a positive impact on, on tens of thousands of low-wage workers, including survivors, and is a, an important step forward in creating a Vermont where all people can thrive. Um, a couple weeks ago, I testified on the housing challenges that survivors face in Vermont, um, and I know that you've heard that uh, earlier today and that it's a problem that you all are well aware of. Um, in Vermont, um, domestic and sexual violence advocates have identified um, lack of affordable housing as one of the, the largest barriers to survivors um, in moving out of shelter and gaining economic independence and stability. Um, it's a, a challenge for Vermonters housing, uh, but especially for minimum wage Vermonters. And I know that you've heard that it would take uh, $22.40 an hour uh, of a wage to afford a two bedroom home in Vermont. So that's $22.40 today not $15 in 2024. We feel like this raise is long overdue. And we also welcome uh, any conversations with you around um, around housing and how to create more affordable housing in Vermont, something we're really committed to. Um, last year I met with a group of survivors, um, young mothers living in shelter. We were there to talk about employment. It was an employment workshop. And they were sharing their work experiences, their challenges now that they were single moms, and their hopes for the future. Uh, when talking about getting back to work, the workforce, they spoke of the challenges of working minimum wage, feeling undervalued, and asking, is it even worth it to work? Then one woman said, very optimistically, and this is a true story, um, I heard that they just passed a bill to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And I had to tell her, yes, they did, um, everyone worked really hard on that bill, but unfortunately, the governor vetoed it. So I wanted to thank you for um, taking the time last session to pass the minimum wage bill, and thank you for taking the time to, to consider it again this year. Um, we, we know that it will have a real positive impact on survivors. We also appreciate the attention paid to the um, potential impacts on the Child Care Financial Assistance Program, um, of those that are, that are on that program. Uh, this is a vital resource for, survivor, um, for survivors with children, 
and we were excited to hear about the governor's um, uh, in the governor's address that he had some money for for that program, um, some extra money. We'll continue to work on advocating for resources um, that are allocated to this program uh, that they match the actual need in the state. Um, so uh, we support raising the minimum wage. Uh, we think it's an opportunity to make real positive change in the lives of the most vulnerable in our state. Um, and we support that change. And um, I would be happy to, to talk about um, the tip to minimum wage if you I just, I I, I'd love to. I mean, you're here, and you were. I, I hadn't realized you were here, and when I wrote down during the course of the testimony from uh, uh, Saru and from Mark, but it would obviously be very helpful if we could get Vermont data on on the sexual harassment impact with yeah. minimum wage workers. Yes, unfortunately, I don't believe that specific data exists. Um, so there has been, I think, very little data collection nationally on the prevalence of sexual harassment. I know the Me Too movement, um, the Times Up, Times Up movement, there has been a lot of conversation, a lot of conversation about sexual harassment um, in the workplace, and there have been several um, national polls, and they kind of show, um, they have different statistics, but they all show that it's a pretty prevalent issue. Um, one of the issues is that, um, when someone is experiencing sexual harassment of that nature, it's not their employer that is, um, or a coworker that's subjecting them to sexual harassment, although we know that that happens, that happens uh, in low wage work, um, but it's actually the customer. So um, I think that you're gonna find that there are probably very little, if any, data on that specific issue, but we know that it happens. Um, and we especially know that uh, Women, especially working in low-wage work, are uh, pretty reluctant to go to an employer and say, you know, this is what I'm experiencing, because uh, they rely on that work, um, on those tips, and um, on that job to uh, provide for themselves and their families. So um, I think that if we eliminated the tip to wage, we could see um, that instance of sexual harassment go down. Um, I think there are a lot of other things that need to change in our culture as well, so I don't think that that is um, going to 100% eliminate um, sexual harassment, but I think that that could be a, a good step in the right direction. Um, Would you, anyway, we should chat and see if you had um, people who were willing to testify about it or if there was no, somebody, even if we don't have the data, Mm -hmm. um, if we could have someone who might, I don't know, I don't understand hearing all this, why uh, restaurant workers, uh, wait, waiters across America haven't unionized. I don't get it. I don't get why they haven't formed a powerful response to, uh, mm -hmm. to all this. This is interesting to me. Yeah, that I think that's some of the work that Saru is trying to do at, at Rock Yeah, Saru is so definitely, yeah. Yes. So, 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 so. We also hopefully will get to, to uh, revisiting the issue of sexual harassment yes. in another bill. Yes, yes, very I, much. Yes, I was yeah. listening to that. But if, if you had witnesses you thought would be appropriate and could speak to this in a knowledgeable way, I think we would really that would be helpful. Okay, I, I did reach out to our advocates um, last week, and we had a discussion around this. I didn't get. Um, anyone that said I have someone that can is going to be willing to testify I can see if if somebody would um, it would be helpful. yeah yeah I think it's easy to dismiss if there isn't testimony about it right and I and I would like to point out that um, oftentimes we hear from employers that are are doing the right thing um, that are, are paying fair wages that have a um, seemingly really great work environment and and we're not hearing from uh, from those workers that are working at places that do not have that type of work environment. Um, because frankly, they don't have the time um, or they're not knowledgeable of the um, of the resources available that, to them. They're not knowledgeable of, um, of what's moving forward. Sure. Uh, they don't have those resources at their fingertips. And so, um, you know, when we hear from employers that are saying, you know, we're not experiencing this, 
um, I think you all know that it's really important to put that into context of um, maybe they're not seeing that in their particular place where they're offering you know great benefits or mm -hmm. um, great wages uh, but it, you have to think about the the folks that are working at kind of the lower um, the lower wage um, across the scale uh, jobs and the um, the ones that may not have the same type of environment. So, thank you. Thank you. Hey. Morning. Morning. So we're here and then we're here from Damien and the Air Force may or may not come in at the very end. Thank you. We get there. We want to Ah, we do, which is a gift, which we no sort of I want to just say for the record that I serve on the board of Humber Blue Vermont. I don't seem to come to yeah. other board meetings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Faye Mack. I'm the Advocacy and Education Director at Hunger Free Vermont. Um, I thank you for having me. Uh, Hunger Free Vermont is also a member of the Raise the Wage Coalition. Um, so we're grateful for the opportunity to um, support S23 um, and talk a little bit about that. Um, I have handed around the testimony that I submitted um, and it goes into um, some a bit more detail and I'll sort of hit the higher levels because I know we're running a little bit behind time today. Um, Hunger Free Vermont, just for reference, because we aren't actually in this room very often, uh, we are a nonprofit statewide um, anti hunger organization. We've been around for about 25 years, uh, and our mission is to end the injustice of hunger and malnutrition for all Vermonters. Um, we focus on the federal nutrition programs as part of our work. So, we've spent the last 25 years helping Vermont make the most of these federal programs um, in an effort to help folks meet their needs and have food on the table, and also so that we are not leaving federal dollars on the table as well. Um, but at the same time, we also are working to change the systems so that more Vermonters can reach economic security on their own. So they don't have to rely on food shelves and food pantries and three scores Vermont to um, put food on their table. And while hunger um, has improved a bit in recent years, it peaked during the recession and has slowly come down, um, it's still an issue that too many Vermonters are struggling with. Right now, about one in 10 Vermonters are struggling with hunger. Um, and families with young children are more likely to be struggling um, you know, with economic security in general and with hunger. One in seven kids in Vermont live in food insecure homes. And many of Vermonters who are struggling are also working. Uh, so as I think this committee has heard and is well aware, there are many people who rely on programs like Three Squares Vermont because their paychecks aren't enough to pay for housing and medication and food and transportation and all of the basic needs that folks need to cover. Um, and an additional area of um, concern are for households who have, and, and this is a population that we think has really grown since the recession. There are a large group of Vermonters who've gone back to work, but they're working for lower wages or they're working for um, working fewer hours than they used to. So there's an increased number of households who are either eligible for three squares a month, but the benefit they would get is so low mm -hmm. that frankly, it's not, you know, it's hard to justify going through the bureaucracy of the program. Um, or they're just above the income limit um, and they're still struggling to make ends meet, so they're not actually eligible for the programs. Those are the folks on that benefits clip that we talk about a lot. Can, uh, in, yeah, could you do us a favor, Faye, mm -hmm. after you testify, if you could give us a chart showing what the cutoffs are? Sure. That sure. would be helpful, just right eligibility. Be, exactly. Yeah, it's always useful because then yeah. you can actually really visualize a the sure. income. I can't. And well, so for Three Squares Vermont, I can just tell you, um, Three Squares Vermont, uh, and I'll send something too, sure. but uh, the income limit is 185% of the federal poverty okay. line. Um, I can send something that has a little bit of like, what does that actually right. look like? Um, LIHEAP is the same. Yeah. Um, and a lot of programs have combined their eligible, have sort of aligned eligibility with Three Squares Vermont in particular. Okay. So eligibility for free and redu reduced price school meals, programs like that all right. fall in. So when you increase, you know, comes in with a benefits cliff, when you increase your wages, you fall, off, you lose multiple programs. So, um, you know, and that's where 
where some of this comes in that the committee has been looking so at. The other thing it would be great to have you bring in is, I actually have heard in our area that food shelf use and the number of clients at the food shelf have increased. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't hear anything about a slipping off of need after the recession. I have only heard increase. Mm -hmm. yes. So uh, I, if you could provide us with the food shelf data and the drop, the in the demand chart or whatever, that would be also helpful. Yeah, and, and to that point, I think where we're, well, we believe where a lot of that increased demand is coming from are those households who are back to work, but they're making less than they were before the recession. So they're not eligible for three squares a month or other programs. Or yeah, that gap. You know, so their, gap their net right income there. is still lower, so they need things like food shelves to go and help supplement their needs. Most people, and this came up during um, the government shutdown, most households run out of their three square a month benefits within the first two to three weeks of the month. Um, it's supposed so to be a supplemental program, but it is not. It is often the, the sole, um, sole money that a household has for food for the month. Was that not recorded? So, just to represent myself from where I was, uh, the you know, you were all part of the reason. Was great. <laughs> thank you. The reason the Hunger for Vermont, you know, as an anti-hunger organization, why we care about issues like minimum wage is that. We believe in ending hunger in a dignified way, and relying on SNAP and relying on food shelves is not a dignified way. No matter, you know, even with all of the work that organizations like Hunger Free Vermont and others throughout the state have done to help make that feel sure. more dignified, mm -hmm. it still isn't, frankly. No, we, hear, we hear it from our constituents all the time. Yeah. Yeah. They want to be able to provide right. themselves. Exactly. Absolutely. And we heard it in spades at our public hearing. We did, yes. Uh, which we may or may not. Another one, but it, it was very clear. So I do want to point out, and I think that Michelle made this point earlier too very well, that while the um, study last year that was done on the minimum wage and the benefits clip very rightly identified that the child care subsidy is a huge, you know, that's a huge fall off point for a lot of families. What the, the study did not quite pull out was the compound impact of losing multiple benefits at once. So while a three square month benefit goes down slowly as incomes rise, when you lose that and LIHEAP and school meals and a bunch of other programs all at once, that is very significant. Um, while they might not look significant on their own. So say, has, has there been a recent change in the alignment of the eligibility requirements? No. So okay. it's, um, three square Vermont, the income limit was increased to 185% of the property line right. in 2009. Okay. Or 2008. Yeah, that, 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 so there has been a little bit because Deb Brank worked really hard on very colorful charts which show all the reductions in all the programs that might not have taken that, all those colors and put it together in one place. But there, there, there was a, yes. and I said this before, I think, yeah, I think you generally see speaking, um, you might see overall, absent the childcare, uh, around 50% cut in. For every, for every yeah, dollar yeah. you make more, you may see a 50% reduction in the, in the uh, plethora of benefits that people get. But again, we asked folks, does that bother you to say, no, we would rather yes. turn our money rather than have the government give us a handout. Okay. And and I do want to be clear, we are very, we, the, the benefits cliff and addressing households who are losing some of their benefits as their incomes rise is not a reason to slow down increasing the minimum wage. Um, I, what, the point that I'm trying to, to make is that this also needs to be looked at, you know, and it is in S23 through the CCFAP language, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate um, it's on our website Deb, Deb's it um, yeah. chart. The study did not take into account school meals, so that is one additional one that I, I would point out. Um, but the other, and so I, so I hear that, and and don't want to encourage any slowing down of, of increasing the wage. Increased wages is the most dignified way to, you know, people should be paid a livable wage for work that they're doing. You should be able to work 
and put food on your table and pay your rent and keep your car running. That's um, you know why people work and wages should be able to meet, meet those needs and the power in being able to meet your own needs is huge and people would you know as you said some of our um, give up benefits in order to, you know, even if their net income is a little bit lower in order to do so. And I thought it's very powerful. I thought we thought it was powerful. <laughs> it was the a cumulatively powerful takeaway from that. Yes. Um, the other area that I do want to touch on is the impact that, that, that I would just encourage the committee to consider. And use the time as the income, you know, if, as S23 moves forward, and if the minimum wage is increased, to use the time as we get toward 15 to also address the impact that increasing wages has on whole communities and the eligibility for different community programs. So our, my area of expertise is in nutrition programs. I suspect that there are other programs in housing and education, um, you know, 21st century funding is one that comes to mind that are all tied to Income lim incomes of communities overall. Um, but within the nutrition programs, um, there are many communities that utilize federal nutrition programs that are able to provide meals at no charge to students and to children. And that includes the summer meals program um, and school breakfast and lunch in particular, in addition to childcare, feeding programs, and after school meal programs. These programs, eligibility to be able to use these programs is based off of community-wide income data or collective meal program data from a community school. So it's not based on an individual household's income. So a broader community is impacted by, by these programs. Um, so just as an example, and I have more in here, I won't go through them all, um, but as an example, towns are able to serve free meals during the summer for all children who are 18 and under when at least 50% of the student attendance area um, are eligible for free school meals, or if the meal site is located in a low-income census tract. So in a bigger picture way, as incomes rise, communities lose eligibility to offer programs like that. Um, communities will also lose the opportunity to offer universal school meals, um, where breakfast and lunch is offered to students at no charge. These programs have broad education, you know, learning, behavior, um, impacts, impacts on school finances and more, and they're a real lifeline for communities, especially during the summer months when school meals aren't available. The impact of that and you know which communities would be impacted with a rising minimum wage is really hard to figure out, um, and I don't know that, and I don't think that we can know that until we get there, but what I wanted to bring that because I think it's something that we should be aware of as we move forward. The, and I would encourage the committee to consider ways during the ramp up of wages to also be addressing the, yeah, to offset the different kinds of programs that would be impacted. Um, and, and as I said before, none of this is a reason to slow down raising the minimum wage, um, but it's part of the eyes wide open, um, it's sort of in line with looking at the benefits cliff, the community level impact I think is also very important, and so I wanted to bring that to you as well. Strokes of what I said. That's terrific. Um, you mentioned the the uh, summer programs of, mm -hmm. of distributing lunch to um, to kids. I I know many of uh, communities in uh, my, in Windsor County do this, but not all. Is everybody charged to accept free and reduced lunch stuff? To charged with doing this in the summer? Because I, I know. Oh, so not, so you know, not the rollout on this is very uneven. Yes, and there has been a huge increase in the number of summer meal sites across the state in recent years. It's that something that we spend a lot sites. of time on um, and work really closely with individual communities to do so. So, as I was, it's a great program. It is a it People is a great program, it. it's and it's just it's been shown to be one of the main drivers in helping students avoid this low income students avoid the summer slide where they lose what they had learned the year before and kids with act, low income children with access to summer meals are more likely to enter back into the fall um, with the same learning as their peers uh, from higher incomes so it's a very crucial program and not all communities are eligible to offer it um, 
eligibility, it's a federal program, and eligibility is connected to either low-income census data or to school income data around reduced price lunch. And, and the point, or a point that I'd like to make around that is that it isn't, these challenges are not tied directly to the minimum wage. They're tied to incomes overall. You know, the, mm -hmm. this impact, you know, we're seeing right now, through school Vermont participation has been declining and that is impacting schools' abilities to continue to offer universal school meals. So the unfortunate reality is that so many federal programs are tied to the federal poverty line in some way, and that that number is artificially low and very outdated. So while it is a good thing when incomes rise, and it is a good thing when communities move out of being called a low-income community when they move out of that, because the federal limits and the poverty thresholds are so low, it doesn't actually signify that the communities are not in need of those programs. Um, you know, community, they, people still need the programs even if they've moved out of what the federal government calls poverty because the line is old and artificial. Thank you. Yeah, and the universal field program, as we know, it helps reduce stigma, cultural stigma, too. If everyone has access to free breakfast and lunch, it means not just poor kids are coming in early. I mean, it's, everybody is available. It's, a bit, it's great. We've just, we at uh, Hunger for Vermont worked with the University of Vermont to do a big study on the impact that universal school meals is having on behavior and learning and school finance and culture, and the results are very astounding. Yeah, no, I, at some point it would be great for you to share those with us because oh, I think as we look at yeah. cultural divide, not yeah. just financial, but culture, uh, social, socioeconomic. And share, just because I always carry them with me, but here are. Yeah, so thank you. I'll pass these around so just for interest. Right. Um, the results of the, of the study. Yes. Yeah. 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 In the bill, and we've heard about them all, but I want to spend some time on one of them with Amy today so we all have that in our head. We talked about the TIF issue. Uh, we talked about uh, what would, if this bill were to pass, minimum wage would go to uh, $15 in 2024. What would the inflation factor be after that period of time, if any? And then one thing that got put in, I think it was a conference committee, was a what some people have been calling a student <coughs> wage or apprenticeship right. wage. Uh, and uh, so I wanted the bill is put in basically reflects what happened last year, which was setting a sub minimum wage of three dollars less than whatever it was basic minimum wages for students, high school students only during the summer months. So I want, if you could just give us the history as you know of what happened in the legislature, where we are, what other states do, just sort of a, a you know, maybe that will go to 12 o'clock for this so you have about 13 minutes. Okay, thank you. For the record, Daniel Leonard, Legislative Council. Um, so you're right, this was added last year. My recollection is it might have been added by the House before it came back and then the conference committee left it in. Um, and you, you described it uh, very accurately. It, it sets the sub-minimum wage of $3 less than the minimum wage. Uh, it's important to emphasize it's for secondary school students. It's not a training wage, which is typically for a limited period of time when someone starts with an employer. So other states or the federal government allow a training wage for a period like 90 days or 180 days where you have a lower minimum wage. Here, uh, as a student, you could start working at 16 and work for the rest of the years of high school with the same employer, uh, but your minimum wage would stay $3 below the minimum wage. 
uh, once you graduated high school, you would immediately bump up to the minimum wage at that point. Um, this doesn't prevent your employer from giving you a raise above the minimum wage, but they could leave you at this lower student minimum wage. Um, and the, the sort of history of this proposal came out of uh, questions that were raised about, well, the first one was, uh, what is the student minimum wage in Vermont? Because our existing law has an exemption for students, which uh, would seem to put the students at the federal minimum wage, but the way our Department of Labor has interpreted it, the students are at the federal minimum wage during the school year, and during vacation periods within the school year, but on summer break, they are subject to the state minimum wage. So that puts employers in a funny position where they can pay them $7.25 an hour during the school year, but then they have to pay them $10.78 an hour during the summer. Um, what became clear during the summer study committee and testimony here was that this was confusing for employers, uh, and also that there was concern among employers about whether they would continue to bring on high school students as the minimum wage approached $15. So this was seen as uh, something that would both provide clarity in the law, providing one wage that applies year round because this wage is above the federal minimum wage, and also uh, prevent employers from possibly not hiring high school students uh, as the wage goes up. Um, I think that gives kind of a general background there. Uh, I don't know if there are studies on whether raising the wage has impacted high school work in other states. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure to the extent that we'd be able to put that together in short order for you. So, so how many states have gotten rid of this inequity? So uh, it, the landscape varies a lot across the country. Um, some states do have a lower student or training wage. Uh, there are a number of states that follow the federal minimum wage. And all of those states, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I shouldn't say for sure, but I think all or most of those states also apply the federal law relating to student minimum wages. Um, so, even with the ones, the seven that got rid of tip minimum wage and have gone to one wage, is it one wage for everybody or just one wage for people 18 and up? So, with the ones that got rid of tip minimum wage, I'd have to look at the individual okay. states. It, that would be helpful because it would be, if they're thinking getting rid of the differential there, have they thought about it all the way through? So. I'd love to know that, what okay. the seven states have done. So what I'll do is um, I will ask one of our interns Great. to take a look at that. Unleash those VLS students. Yes. So Nothing. and it, it's, it's also important to note that a lot of states don't have a separate student minimum wage yep. and don't have a training minimum wage. They just have a minimum wage. Right, which is And so the, the landscape across the country is is extremely variable on whether there's a tipped minimum wage, uh, whether there is a student minimum wage, and whether there is a training wage. Right, so maybe when the DLS student is doing this, we could get not just the seven states that have gotten rid of tipped minimum wage and see how they handle students, but also find out for the rest of the country how it, it, it happens to do that way. All right, so can you, can you, uh, does it happen real fast at the end? Could you tell us what was going on in the house that they suggested this? You've got the color background. <laughs> sure. So there, there was a bill introduced uh, last year by I think it was Representative Briglin, um, who uh, had proposed uh, a lower student minimum wage. Um, and I can't remember if he proposed just uh, clarifying that the exemption applied to secondary school students year round, or which would have moved them to the federal minimum wage, or if he just proposed a lower minimum wage. Uh, but that proposal was discussed in the House and then incorporated into the bill as, as a sort of compromise. Um, and I think it was 
you know, folks who were, um, it was a compromise for folks who were concerned, uh, had some concerns about it, raising the minimum wage to 15 and its impact on My places and like, Bob's and, Tim's and Dairy Cream and, and <laughs> folks like, places like that that rely on a lot of high school labor. So if this had become law, would the student minimum wage during the school year be $7.25 or $15? No, so if this became, if this bill uh, became law, what would happen is next January 1st, uh, we would have a minimum wage of $11.50 uh, and a student minimum wage of eight fifty. But year round. Year down. Year down. No, year round. But the we student did that. minimum we did wage would be year round. So it wouldn't revert to the federal. So we would not revert to the federal. We would have a separate student minimum wage that tracked our minimum wage, but basically on a lower parallel line. And that minimum wage would apply year round, regardless of summer or winter. So we eliminated that mm -hmm. issue with the federal to state minimum wage balance and it would be uh, three dollars and then it it was higher than the federal minimum wage but lower than the, the state minimum wage it's, it's pretty hard to justify that given the uh, data that michelle fay presented but if this became, if this became the law you would just <coughs> deduct three dollars from the state labor. that's right if this became the law and and i was a business out there and so i had some college students and some high school students working for me. The, the college students would be subject to the state minimum wage. The high school students would be subject to a minimum wage three dollars lower. Uh, uh, was there less. any, yes. uh, what was the interpretation that was given to the existing law vis-a-vis -vis college students? The interpretation of the Department of Labor, our State Department of Labor, is that the existing law uh, does not exempt college students. College students need to be paid the minimum wage. So and this proposal doesn't change that? This proposal does not change that. There was confusion on that issue as well, uh, which came up during the, the summer study committee. Uh, and there's a footnote in that summer study committee report which notes that the estimate from the Vermont State Colleges was based on if the minimum wage did not apply to student labor, and then there's a higher estimate in the footnote if it did apply to student labor. And so I think one of the things that kind of became clear last year is there's confusion both among employers, uh, and the Department of Labor has an interpretation, but it's never been challenged. Uh, and so it's, it hasn't gone to, to court. What they do is they basically because the minimum wage law is considered a remedial law, it's remedying uh, problems presented by extreme low wages, um, it, they interpret it in favor of the workers to the greatest extent possible. So with, with the word students, because it doesn't specify uh, post-secondary or secondary, they interpret it only to apply to secondary school students. Um, with the terms uh, during any or all parts of the school year, I believe is the way it's phrased, or during all parts of the regular school year, they interpret that to be your start at the end of summer through the end of the school year in June or whenever you get out, uh, and they leave the summer months out of that except exemption from the law. Um, so in, in every case, they're trying to provide they're taking the exemption into account and trying to provide the greatest benefit to workers that the exemption provides. Like I said, this never has never gone to court or been challenged um, that uh, either I or my counterparts at the Department of Labor are aware of. And so that's the interpretation that stood up. But again, there was confusion um, even among employers who were testifying about whether they were subject to federal or state, and with some of them erring on the side of just paying the state minimum wage, whether it was administratively easier or because they weren't sure when they could pay the federal minimum wage. So they have three choices to do what happened last year, to leave it 
some degree of uncertainty or to do a unified minimum wage for students? Right. For high so. For secondary, because you can't legally pay until 16, right. or it's just 16 to 18 is what we're talking about. Right, well, there, there are some or exceptions 18. to that, um, but Families. there we could go through those, but it's probably a topic for another day. The you're child labor that. laws allow some work before the age of 16, but generally it's 16 Farm. to 18 it's years. It's usually ag stuff, isn't it? Family yeah. businesses family and other businesses. things like that. Uh, uh, families are allowed to abuse. It's just too classic, isn't it? <laughs> families are allowed to abuse the, the people closest to them. Thank you, Committee. Uh, I have a, a question, though. Absolutely. A child child labor labor is regarding the, the way the bill is structured right now, a person who is getting a student wage, if that person drops out of school during the course of school, uh, they are immediately eligible for a higher wage. Oh, that's, that's correct. The, that's the problem. Yeah, they're no that longer a secondary school. Right, exactly. That, 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 it encourages that. that. A, a perverse incentive. It is. It's right, so one incentive. alternative there would be instead of saying secondary school students, if you wanted to preserve the lower minimum wage, you could say individuals uh, 18 years of age right. or less, so or under 18 specific. years of age. Or just unify it. If you did not want to preserve that, but you wanted to eliminate the ambiguity, you could either clarify the definition or eliminate the exemption in the definition. Um, and so those are, those are kind of your options. You can move them down to the federal minimum wage. You can clarify around what the, the alternative state lower wage would be, or you could eliminate it altogether and it'd be subject to and, the And I have wage. to say, I think a lot of this differential came from a time when it was an additional luxury for kids to work and if they were earning more money. Now it is essential for college. It is an essential component of how people are paying for college and how families are paying for college, or not, or for further training, or just to live. And to see that statistic about the 18 to 24 year olds living in poverty, it's gobsmacking. I mean, you know, it just to me is, you know, to continue this inequity is just beyond comprehension. Given what we know now about what younger people are doing, I mean, the, the, the money they're earning is essential for families and for further education. So, it's beyond, uh, just think of your brother. I, I have to go to a church. Yep.